You could save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, but when we just come out and say it, it feels like it falls a bit flat. So we're going to use humor. But we don't want to insult your intelligence, so nothing too goofy. And we need to avoid any polarizing topics. Oh, and it has to be about how you can save big when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive. You know what? Maybe humor is a bad idea. Yeah, it's never going to work. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. This is Jordan Grace, and you're listening to the Social Suplex Podcast Network. BWB, this is One Nation Radio. You better get it right. Rich Ladder, James Boyd came to give him life. The Blackest Wrestling Podcast has come to kick all ass and drop it six feet if they kick it trash. Word, let me welcome y'all to something different. And if you dig it, man, you should let some friends listen. We be getting it in this on the regular, dude. Ravish and flow, but this shit rule. See, James don't rap, so I had to break it down. The whole network, man, we coming for the crown. Raps in the columns, I keep them both covered Making the beats too, so the listeners can bump it Hit us with the rating, yeah, I'm saying it's a five Before you hit it, talk, bob your head side to side It's One Nation Radio, and this is the beginning It's Rich, and I'm here with James It's time to listen to One Nation You got to unleash the power of the pyramid this is Mike Sempervivi from WrestlingObserver.com. Check me out on Wrestling Observer Live every day. And also check out your boys, Rich and James, on One Nation Radio. Uh, this is Kenny Omega. We're listening to One Nation Radio. Check it out, guys. These guys know what's up. Big Kenny Omega fans. That's all it counts to me. Goodbye and good night. Hey. Hey, folks. Welcome to One Nation Radio. I'm James Boyd. And here with me, I have Rich Lotto. What's going on, man? I can't believe that. I ain't going to see it. Forget it. Forget the forget the whole part where it's all the what's going on things, all of that stuff. Let's just get to it. You want to start the show talking about Jeff Jarrett. So you, the floor is yours. Go, go ahead and do your thing. I ain't got nothing for you. Go ahead. Man, on this show for years, uh, we have talked about Double J, Jeff Jarrett, a man that through, I don't even think any skill of his own, just a lot of great stuff happening to him over the years, being in the right place at the right time, knowing the game, working, carnying, you know, canoodling, hustling his his way. He's he's hustled his all his uh, he has hustled his way all the way through the last 35 years of wrestling from every territory you can think of, from starting his own promotion to now he's he's worked himself into being an executive in WWE. He now will, it was announced today, will be booked as an opponent in Ric Flair's last match, wrestling Ric Flair. Um, the night after that or before that, he's going to be refereeing the Usos Street Profits match at SummerSlam. Uh, we know what he did to GCW this year, how he, he basically took them fools to the cleaners, beat their top stars, and then left without doing a job. And I commend Double J for that. Um, I just, you know, for, for years we've had the Jeff Jarrett Finesser of the Year um, award on One Nation Radio, and we've given it to various individuals that, you know, basically pull the the big. You know, they they work. You know, they they find a way to hustle their way into to greater positions that that you can't really explain. I I feel like this year we need to break the rule, James. The the rule for the long time for a long time has been Jeff Jarrett's name is on the award. We don't need to nominate him. Essentially, it, it's kind of been a loose rule. He has been someone that you know. In some of those years, there was like no reason because he would, you know, be inactive. But uh, it was actually like he was a sleeping giant because, you know, he woke up hard as ever. So I, I don't know if this should be a uh, a lifetime achievement award, like an automatic award that we give out. You know how Dave gives out best boss office draw, like where he basically uh, gives out the award. Or do we just put this man uh, on the ballot like this year and let everyone vote for it? And then... <laughs> And he ha- and he has a chance to finally win his own award. I'm I'm of the belief that if you are if it's named after you, you can't win it. That that's I'm of the belief of. And also, it's like 
combine all that stuff, that's cool. Like, but I don't think I can I can compare any of that to like Steve Austin main eventing a fucking WrestleMania in 2022. I'm sorry. Like he and he did it with like one promo. <laughs> so I, I think that's a really high bar to, to be Steve Austin, but it, We'll talk about it. We'll see what else Jeff Jarrett may also be able to add to his legacy this year. To his, you know, uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, His, like, post-2012 LeBron uh, type of uh, career where it's like he he keeps adding to his MVP award share. This man going to finish like he may not win again, but he's always going to finish like the top five. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. And, And, you know, Jeff Jarrett. There are no limits. You know, I, I got a feeling like, you know, you know, you forgot Triple A, too. He buried somebody on Triple yeah, A at the first uh, at the first um, Triple Mania this year in uh, Tijuana. Jeff Jarrett, like, you know, finds a way to, to make a dollar like Master P and finds a way to make a dollar off of something. Um, What's it? Wait, quick question, because now it's going to bother me unless I f- go and figure this out. The first Triple A this year was in Tijuana or Monterey. Can't remember. I think it was in Monterey. That's right. I and then think. I think the second was in Tijuana. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to look it up. It's gonna bother me unless I fear. Double J always wins. Like he, he I can't believe it. Like this, it's gonna be him and uh, Jay Jay Lethal are gonna be taking on Ric Flair and Andrade. Um, I won't be watching this show, but <laughs> I'm sure somebody out there will be will be checking it out. You know what's funny? Like having Jeff Jarrett in <laughs> Jay Lethal when Jeff Jarrett making by basically being like Ric Flair on a on a horse. Mm-hmm. Um and Jay Lethal made a name for himself by doing Ric Flair impersonations. Like yep. this is also like kind of self serving and it adds to the ego Ric Flair that like, look, my legacy also made these two fucking assholes that I'm that I'm gonna put in my uh in my main event for my last match that I'm selling a pay-per-view that's only that people only really want to watch it because like <laughs> I already had my last match years ago people think about and it's not gonna be as good as that match but like people are going to tune in because they're going to see like this good ass undercard that I've finagled into from all over the world getting all this top talent to come in to, to uh, wrestle on the undercard of this show so like I mean we could say that Ric Flair is uh is, should be eligible for Finesse of the Year not just uh I, I not don't know just him as Rick. well I don't know if it's Rick that I necessarily want to credit for this. It's got to be Conrad that, you know. That I'm willing to hear that, too. I'm willing to hear that as well. pulled off this scam, you know, like. We, but that's we, also we, a long, that's also a long-term thing with Conrad. Conrad has turned, what does he sell? What, what does he sell? Insurance? Real estate, real I est- believe. Real estate or, into or all these. mortgage loans. Mor- mortgage right. loans. He has turned mortgage loans and out of the middle of Alabama into all these podcasts that then sprung Bruce Pritchard into being hired again in to help Vince ruin his uh his television product, his TV shows. And then you also have Jeff Jarrett uh back. Rick Flair is back. Shivani is on is doing commentary on national uh television every or twice a week now again. Like what a renaissance. What a renaissance. All because of one man named Conrad. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, pretty much every promotion you can th- think of. Of course, like, you're looking at Ric Flair and Andrade, Jarrett and Jay Lethal. I imagine the political conversations that went on with a WWE executive teaming with an AEW wrestler to fight an AEW wrestler and <laughs> Ric Flair. Um, I've got a feeling the falls are going to be coming between, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, I feel like, well, I know who's not getting pinned. Jeff Jarrett's not getting pinned. Um but we'll see if, if it's a case of where, you know, they want to allow Rick to win or if it's Andrade going over lethal. I don't I don't know which way it's going to go. But, um, yeah, knowing Rick, he'll, he'll want to pitch to lose to somebody. But if Jeff Jarrett is standing tall at the end of this, can, can we can we make the bet if Jeff Jarrett wins, meaning get the pinfall or the submission, he needs to be nominated. I don't want him on the list, so I'm, 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 I just want to say no, just off the, just off the chance that it won't happen, but fine, I'll, I'll indulge your nonsense, since we already started this fucking show with Jeff Jarrett to begin with, I'll, sure, why not, I'll allow it, sure. 
Uh, just just looking it up. I just uh, because I can't help myself. Yeah, Monterey was the first uh, Triple Mania this year, and the second year, second one was Tijuana. Last was Mexico City. Awesome. Um, so so all the promotions are involved in this. Triple A, MLW, New Japan, Impact, like are sending official matches. AEW is not sending an official match, uh, but they are sending uh, Pillman and Brock Anderson uh, to team up. Um, they have, of course, Lethal and Andrade. Seems like they were like, yo, uh, or the Briscoes are also on the show. It looks like uh, and they're facing the Von Ericks. So this is, I don't know. I feel like there's, there's something going on. Like people, like <sighs> some of these people look, gonna look funny in the light. I, you know, working on this show. Um, and you know, it, it's like the dark side of the ring episode never happened. Um, and all these, everybody has looked the other way, uh, on this once again, um, you know, and <laughs> essentially, you know, where he, he was not allowed to show up when all that thing was going on. Um, why did I hear something about like him in WWE? Well, he's been back in WWE, kind of like they put okay. him back in the signature. They've like seemingly they've allowed Jeff Jarrett to do this. They've mm, okay. um, can you say it again? You froze for a second. Yeah, I, I said um, all the uh, things where Ric Flair and Becky Lynch were having those issues over the man, and you know him kind of being on, on the rocks with them relationship wise. All that's been smoothed over of late. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, whatever, whatever, man. Like, uh, who knows what the agendas are at, for any given time with, with, uh, you know, the promotion? Because it's like it's not about you know morality. So correct, correct. Um, yeah. So I guess we can get to uh, the AW Fighter Fest uh, review. Uh, so th- this show uh, Wednesday, excellent show. Um, it was like. Lots of like very good matches um, up and down the show. Uh, one I would say like a borderline match of the year candidate. Um, this is opened up with Wardlow and Orange Cassidy, uh, and there was a singles match for the TNT Championship. Wardlow's first defense comes against Orange Cassidy. I was kind of perturbed by that. I was like, well, why would these two popular guys have to go against each other right now? Um, this match ruffled all got all the wrong or the correct people uh upset uh with Wardlow having to sell for Orange Cassidy and uh it I, I don't know where, where people get like Orange Cassidy is much closer to a like actual wrestler than like a comedy jobber. Like so I, I don't know what like, you know, it's been three years now. Like it, it it's like he's just a wrestler now. So I, I don't I don't know why people still take him for for this this uh this joke uh, I would say I don't know I didn't see it um I I luckily was away from that nonsense being taught like he's a talented fake fighter he can fight the other talented fake fighter it's fine I, yeah. I, I, I don't I don't get it I, I don't get it um like Orange Cassidy does the comedy stuff he tells a story that he is luring people in, and then he's going to catch people with lucha moves. And the lucha moves involve him throwing his weight around to get people to take DTs on their head or whatever else. He's not. It's not like. It's not like what he what he did to uh, Warlow is like the stuff he did with Ethan Page, where he's building towards a body slam, and he eventually body slams Warlow at the end of the match. That didn't happen. He didn't lift him over his head and give him a gorilla press, uh, spine bust like he's fucking Goldberg. Like he's just. He just f- did a bunch of flips and dived on him and dived around him, and then get- and then hit him and with them. like you know Superman punches, which Warlow sold because he got hit with a running jumping punch to the face. He didn't get pinned by it or put down by it because he's much bigger than him. Yeah, I, I-, um, I don't I don't know what these people want. Like watch UFC. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. UFC just had a just had a huge card this weekend and a bunch of crummy matches on it. Feel free, have at it. Um, but Warlow ended up getting the win. This was a very good match. Um, 
puts some of those, you know, our, our belief in Wardlow and, you know, where we think he can end up as a worker. Uh, I think he paid off nice. It paid off nice, quite handsomely in this match. And, um, you know, he's not there yet, but I, Wardlow is not someone that we have really had major concerns with because like at every stage of his career, he's, it feels like he's either met or exceeded the challenge, like going back from his debut. Yeah, for the most part, and I thought this match was really good. Like, I, don't, I have to look and see what I gave this match. I, uh, I probably gave it like three and a half. Uh, let me scroll up and see. Yeah, three and a half. It was a very fun match. I, I you know, so um, three and a half for opener is more than good enough. Like I said, it was a very good match. That's what three and a half is. So, um, and I was entertain i enjoyed like the part where orange well i also really enjoy like when they bring out orange cassidy first and then they do the uh the inset video with, with trent and with we're chucky gonna T, cheat and they're like he's bigger he's stronger so you know what that means and then chucky T goes this i thought this was like the, one of the best moments he's ever had in aw we're gonna cheat and i was just like i fucking howled and orange cast was like i don't care whatever and then <laughs> And then these fucking guys, they throw out a chair to try to run distraction on the ref. And then Chucky e. T pulls from underneath the ring a fucking chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> and then he turned around. And then the ref turned around. I think it was Bryce, right? Bryce Rosberg? Yeah. Bryce Rosberg turned around. He was like, what the fuck? Are you, what the fuck are you doing? You, you want to murder him? Like, why do you get a gun? Why are you pulling a gun? Well, you can't do it in, in this day and age or whatever else. You can't pull out a gun in, in uh, a fake gun in, in a crowded space in this uh, day and age or any day and age. But what the hell am I talking about? But anyway, he uh, they pull out the fucking cordless or not cordless, but uh, pulled out a fucking chainsaw. I don't know if there was a chain in. I don't know. I don't know. It looked like it was an electric one, I, whatever. But uh, it, it threw him out. Obviously, they go up to ca- go up there, and then like that gave. Orange Cassidy the time to like, like build around and do some stuff. And like, you know, I thought the match was fun. Like, Warlow was very mean and didn't sell a lot of Orange Cassidy's nonsense. And Orange Cassidy was like shook that the, some of the goofiness and wasn't working. And that, like, in a real situation, he would get his ass whooped. So he kept sticking and moving and kept coming up with ways to try to off get Warlow off balance by using, you know, his momentum. Like, I thought this was a well-told story. I thought it was entertaining as hell, and I thought that the right person won, and I also liked the part where Warlow beat him with one power bomb. He didn't give him a symphony, because that would have got him heat. And then at the end, he fist-bumped him. Yeah. Um, so. I thought this, I, went, as, I thought this about, went about as well as you could have asked. In fact, like, if they had saved this for a pay-per-view, I wouldn't have mind. It's At like all. they got. It's like they avoided all the pitfalls that I thought existed with this thing. It would have like, got war. It would have got Warlow under. Yes. Yeah. Same here. So it was like, wow, they did it. Like <laughs> exactly. Like because that's a really tough needle to thread, and like to get over Warlow being a serious guy, keep keep like the cool stuff factor of Orange Cassidy, like, I. It, you're right. It really is a hard needle to, th- to thread, and they were able to do it. Yep. Um, second match on the show, uh, or before we get there, um, we had, um, one second after that, we had Chris Jericho, uh, in a promo or they showed a video package of pack defending against show to Umino and rev pro not fit for national television, <laughs> real dark in there. Um, making NSC 2.0 look like this bright oasis, or NXT 1.0 black and gold look like this bright oasis. Um, I want to know who whose cell phone they be using to record these Rev Pro shows, and I also want to know who's like, like their audio is always a mess. Yeah, and always like it always feels like it's super hot and and like it's always peaking. So I, I can't even. So that's one thing is whatever, and it's all, and sometimes it's distorted as hell, and they still just say fuck it, just put it out for people to consume. But like watching on, um, watching d- uh, dark for the first time in at this point more than a year um, for that match, it was like wow! Like they need to give Red Pro a camera or something because <laughs> like I, their their video quality is like worse than 
worse than like some of these Joshi promotions that have Bro. like 300 people at a <laughs> like, show sometimes. Somebody, somebody give them a DSLR camera like and quit playing and, and a tripod, please. I want to know what iPhone they're using. Like what the number is on the iPhone they're using to record this one. Five, six. I, I can't really call it, but like that ain't 720p. <laughs> that is not seven twenty seven p or that is not seven twenty p at all. That's got to be that's got to be somewhat else. That's got to be either like a something in the fives or fours. S- something they got an eye behind it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we had Chris Jericho come out. Um, he came out in a red suit. Uh, it's the first time I can recall Chris Jericho wearing a suit in AEW since like the uh, opening like press conference in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, you'd have to check me on that, but I really can't recall him suiting up. So um, he came out by himself. No, no Jericho appreciating society, and it seemed like he was, you know, you know, dead serious. He ended up, you know, he told everybody that he comes to him as a living legend uh, and as Eddie Kingston's superior. Uh, Jericho brought up Kingston's friendships and how associating with Kingston seems to end bad for somebody, um, especially citing the Ruby Soho thing. Um, he, Chris Jericho then talked about the barbed wire match. He called Kingston a mark for Onita and Sabu and Funk, but Jericho said he was the one that won the first ever Canadian barbed wire match at the tender age of 22 years old. A real thing. Someone looked it up on Cage Match too, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, Jericho said he he's, uh, thinks people underestimate him because of his massive accomplishments and his movie star good looks. Next week, you won't be able to underestimate Chris Jericho, because you'll be facing the pain maker. So uh, he's going to bring the pain maker back out. He said it's going to be the final fight in the Jericho and Kingston saga. When it's over, Kingston is going to crawl back into his hole of addiction and depression. Uh, he's a, basically like talking about the mental and health mental stuff. Health is- and mental issues. He also mentioned that. Yep. Yes. Mental issues like, man, like and then he real said he, heel. Yeah, and then he also said that he said, yeah, all that stuff that you use as, as excuses. I was like, oh, this is good. Yep. This is he good. said, the only thing that'll wash away Jericho's sins is a massive wave of blood, and you're not a liar, you're a loser. So, yes. I popped. Uh, yeah, Jericho just does it again um uh, an incredible an incredible promo here yeah and i like it because like kingston has to win that's the only reason i like it like if, if jericho wins this fucking match i'm not gonna i'm gonna take back everything i said about this promo i love this from what happened because i was like he's putting over he's put over kingston again if jericho wins this one i'm gonna come back and i'm gonna be like nah nah i don't like this i, I don't like this but um yeah uh it's, they're still doing the shark cage thing, right? Yeah, they they did kind of modify the gimmick. They're now calling it a barbed wire everywhere match. So it's like there's not like a like originally it was like death match and stuff like that. So I don't exactly know what this match means. Is it like, okay. hey, are we gonna have weapons that are wrapped in barbed wire? Are they gonna barbed wire the ropes? Are they gonna have a barbed wire bed? Or so, they're gonna have well, a cage I- or something? Like I don't know. Well, I'm assuming much like Stardom and Showcase, you'll find out right before the match starts. <laughs> Man. Uh, so after that, Kingston was backstage with Ruby and Ortiz. Ortiz, you know, very bald and Ruby very hurt. Um, so he said he was pissed. Jericho got five minutes. He only got 30 seconds. He wants the most violent version of Jericho out there next week. And he said he's going to basically fuck him up. So. After that, we got William Regal on commentary. We had the uh, interim AEW World Championship Eliminator match. John Moxley versus Kanosuke Takeshita. And Kanosuke Takeshita does it again. Um, uh, make, does another match where you're like, fuck, just let this dude win already. Um, of course, there had it was John Moxley in 2022. So someone had to bleed in this match. Um but this was really good. Um, this was, I thought, to catch the superior guy, I think he should have won this match and then set up a rematch. But that's not the way to decide to go with it. They have um, clearly something they want to do with Moxley. They want to put him towards CM Punk. They're not taking any um, skin off the, the pig uh, here. So uh, this was excellent. Yeah, but yeah. This, this, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, but like, so it's time to win for the, he's he lost to the champion now. It's time for for Takeshita. Savannah, Georgia, going nuts over this man. Yeah, that's what I was getting at, and I think that's a part of um, 
why they had him him bleeding much like when he came up bleeding off of the, like the running boot which um I gotta say when you give a running boot to somebody like that makes a whole hell of a lot more sense to blade off a running boot and getting gashed and bust over from a running boot than you getting hit with a disaster kick on it with a bare foot with a sock on it just just saying but um I thought that uh <coughs> This match was great, and, I, and when he came up bleeding, it made me think of... And then the match continued. I was like, oh, he's like, this is... S- parallels to the to the Willer Yuta match, right? Um, I don't think this match was um, nearly as dramatic as the, as the Willer Yuta match, but this match was great. I, I, I would even argue that it may have been better wrestled. I have to go back and watch the uh, Willer Yuta match. Uh, but um, this match was awesome, and is one of the best matches in AEW this year. And now Takeshi, he has, what, three or four of these now. Um, in short order. Like, he, micro, he's microwavable at this point. Um, and he, I mean, like, I think the thing that, like, for, for me, this, like, just, is satisfying watching is, like, all his matches are getting over by just being meat and potatoes wrestling. Like, he's not doing a bunch of crazy flips and dives where people can dismiss it. Like, he's going out there. You, he's getting hit, he's hitting back, he's getting thrown, he's throwing back, he's throwing German suplexes and forearms and hitting the ropes really fucking hard and being and adding dramatics in between it. And, like, it's just... It, wrestling that will work to any... And he's doing big dives. Yes, he's also doing that. But he's doing, like, one of those, right? It's not like uh, Ninja Mac. It's not like Ninja Mac. No, no, wrong with Ninja Mac. I'm about to give some shots, some props to Ninja Mac in a minute, but... um. He is basically like any wrestler, any, you know, wrestler under 240 from like the last 30 years, he could wrestle with any of them. He got that dog in him. He just does. Yeah. This is like, <laughs> like I felt uh, very confident in his abilities to come over here and, you know, do well. Um, they have positioned him against very top people. So, like, yep. it seems like there's a, uh, there's a strategic element to what's going on with him. So I feel like there's, you know, the fans that he's making that are that are dying to see him win, and I'm one of them. And I, I I think there's something around the corner for him. And he's just rapidly ascending. Like, and, you know, people talk about, hey, you know, these are the, like, you know, like when they were watching Willie Yuta week after week, well, say, oh, a star is being made and all this stuff, which I – was like okay um this guy for real is like the real like <laughs> like he's the real i i would say that i think what may be coming around from him is like he becomes the second um or they're building him to become the uh the all atlantic champion right uh i think that probably makes the most sense i don't think it, i think you know um we're building him towards that you have this you know great match with pack you know somewhere down the line um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's great. He's great. I mean, I can't go through the match because, like, there's been too many hours it of wrestling. <laughs> all of it all of it runs together right now. But uh, it was a great match. It's one of the best matches I saw uh, this past week. And that's a lot of fucking wrestling. So they showed um, uh, Brody King uh, basically saying he's watched Darby ascend for years. Uh, he said, I'm getting mine by taking yours. He attacked Darby at a sign this past weekend. This feud kind of is also an import from Evolve, uh, which they will never mention uh, as far as the promotion where it came from, which is funny. Um, but yeah, uh, this is set up a match next week between Brody King and Darby Allen. And, you know, as a big time Darby fan, it's been a long time since Darby's like really had something to celebrate and it is uh, win. really to win. It and, is win. And, and something like you know, to really like sink his teeth into, like he kind of got thrown in on the pay-per-view, um, the last two pay-per-views. Yep. Um, and you know, he's part of a six man and, and the other, uh, pay-per-view it's like, it's time to get Darby heated back up again. So I think this would be a great, you know, spot to let it off. Yeah. Um, I think you should win and I think they should figure out a place of where to head him to. Like if, they, if that, so I think right now Malachi is going to be kind of um, preoccupied with Miro. 
um, whenever they decide to get to that, but they've been building on it ever since their um, match of Forbidden Door. Um, because that was a the four way, yeah. So I I think that I, I wonder what's next for Darby. Like, um, I mean, they could have pulled the trigger and, and gave them a, sh- a shot for the tag team titles. Um, I think there's still time for that. Uh, like, or they can pull that trigger whenever they want to because they're so over Sting and Darby. Um, but like, in order to get to that or to get to um the next program, he kind of needs to be heated up some. And go from there. Um, it's almost like, in a weird way, with all the new people in, um, and people going down with injuries or whatever else, like a person that you would have relied on would have been Darby, but and they have, but he's been eating losses. Um, yeah, like this kind of the first time there's there hasn't been like a lot of clear focus on what he's doing and where he's headed uh, for the first time in AEW in. That's going to happen when you get so many, you know, plates spinning in the air. But um, I'm with you. I kind of I kind of want to see him get back on track right now because it's not like he's I don't think he's colder. Um, but I kind of feel he, like he's just treading water. Yeah. <clears throat> and we were talking about this guy last summer is like this, like this big draw for uh, television rating right. wise and main eventing, uh, main eventing, like that, yeah. holding the belt and, you know, being really keyed in at, at all points and just has not had that same focus throughout the first like six months of this year. So need Darby to get uh, back going here. So yeah. uh, the varsity blondes are already in the ring for the next segment. That's never a good sign. Uh, Griff Garrison basically looks like jungle jungle boy. And Christian points this out, calling back the, uh, the BTE skit for Griff Garrison. Um, he said <laughs> Brian Pillman Jr. had a father who was a legend, but in Christian's opinion, he was average at best. So if you have a dead relative, don't go near Christian Cage right now. Um, he thinks uh, Pillman Sr. would be appalled knowing that his lasting contribution to wrestling was Brian Pillman Jr. Man, that was a um, <laughs> a burial. That was a, yo, you should get your shit and leave. Uh, because, and then, uh, you know, Luchasaurus destroys Gif- Griff Garrison. Uh, because he looks like Jungle Boy. Yeah, so he hit him um, with the uh, the nerve hold uh, uh, snare trap. I think he calls it a was it a tar, tar pit? pit. That's yes. right, tar pit. Yeah, uh, quick squash and uh, fucked him up. Pillman tried to do the save, but Lucius uh, head butted him and choke slammed him uh, and choke slammed uh, onto Griff on the announce table. Didn't break the first time. It was a I am the table moment. Uh, so. Christian whispered to Lucasaurus, do it again. And we got the proper break. And if you told me the varsity blondes were to never be seen again, I would be like, makes sense. They got fucked up. You yeah, know, uh, <laughs> was that a write off? Bro, this is what I'll say. When Drew McIntyre was whooping Dean Ambrose's ass uh, at first in the spring of 2019, I, I don't think he took anything as vicious as uh, that second choke slam that. Uh, Pillman caught off Griff Garrison because man, the second one looked devastating. His second one, like, uh like his head is like ding, ding, dong, ding, 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 <laughs> ding, 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 dong. Keep your hands ringing. Like he, that knock, that knocking got shook. Yes, indeed. Um, so after we had uh, Garcia in 2.0 uh, uh, backstage, uh, they didn't understand what it was all about. And, you know, uh, Matt Menard being a total gimmick. Uh, fucking uh, Angela Parker pulls out a switchblade on Tony Schiavone, which is like, they, like, they just get it, bro. Like, they're the fucking best. Uh, well, the switchblade, when he's, uh, he freaked out and he was like, it's just a comb. Yeah. And I was like, he, and then I thought to myself, because of his hair and then the way he dresses, like he doesn't like a person to have a switchblade comb, that fucking dork. And I was like, you know what? That worked. That was funny. That was funny. Cute, but uh, funny. Garcia said he understands why he's in the cage because he's dangerous. Uh, they basically leave Garcia alone at this point, and he kind of uses that promo time to build up him and Wheeler Yuta. It's going to be out for the pure title at uh, Death for Dishonor. Um, he said he's tired of Yuta being a cheap Daniel Garcia imitation. So uh, they should have a phenomenal match uh, with uh, the pure title on the line. Hopefully they can find a way to make the pure title interesting, you yeah. know, in, in ways that I've never seen to be interesting. So um, that's just me. Don't don't yell at me about your 2005 ring of honor. I didn't watch that shit. Sorry. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, like that was 15 years ago plus. Like I, I didn't have I didn't have the, the DVD. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's like oh when Dangle oh when when uh, Brian Danielson was doing it. Oh okay. Are these these motherfuckers? Dang, no. Oh okay. So like, um, is he one of the greatest wrestlers? Is Willie you <laughs> the one of the greatest wrestlers ever? Is that a trick question? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's he's just the biggest star in the business. That's it. That, that's all uh, at this go. point. Shit again. <laughs> you know, and at this point, you know, that's that's where we got to keep it. You know, oh my God. not ready for all time status yet, but um, Hangman was backstage, uh, had the phone in his hands. There's a whole Hangman Bucks reunion kind of swirling around, and they're doing lots of hints uh, here. Um, then uh, Hangman was kind of cut off. Uh, they asked him about being eliminated in the Battle Royal, but Silver and Reynolds came up and said they were pissed, and they challenged uh, the House of Black for Rampage, called them spooky perverts, dead serious, no, um, you know, no hesitation about it. Yes, like completely lacking in self words, which is what you want out of most of your pro wrestlers. You don't want them, you know, thinking about some of the terrible things they do and some of the ridiculous things they do, but when. <clears throat> This guy that is a founding member of this incel cult said that uh, called another group of people to spooky purpose. I, I I fucking howled like this was this was like the Jericho levels of lacking of self awareness. But like he's a baby face, which made it funnier because it worked. Yep. After that, we had uh, William Regal back on commentary. Um, Claudio Castagnoli taking on Jake Hager. I was bored at first, and then I thought this turned into something decent. So. We do not need to ban Jake Hager from the arena, James. Um, what 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 did I give the over under for that? Did I? I don't remember what it was. I don't think you. I don't think you gave an over under. It, it, it did turn into a good match. It was a good match by the end. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of that was because you know. But I will say this: like the WWE classic formulaic layout of shine cut off, you know, and going through the, going through all of that to get to you know uh, the closing stretch, like. It really stands out in AEW because it's like stuff just moves faster. And like, to be fair, like Claudio in his match with um Saber, they did not wrestle like this. But um, like it just stood out in like I think if we had um someone better than Hager in there, I think like an occasional match like that in dub in AEW wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, I, not a steady diet of it, but like when there's so much variety of what you get in AEW between the hard hitting, some of the flying stuff you get with the with you know Phoenix or whatever else, and then like some of the uh, let's say technical aspects like like Dangles and stuff, and then like some of the in all of the Bret Hartism that you see in up and down this show, like having a like a WWE like pattern match, like. It wasn't like some. It wasn't like some um, some uh, bad sight to see on AEW. But I just would rather. Ha- I just would rather have it done by like uh, a higher level wrestler than than Hager. Yeah, I, I usually try to run like as far as uh, from WWEism as I can when thinking about what I want to see in AEW. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I want them to do the complete opposite. Um, so that's just me, though. No, but, so okay. So, but you get what I'm saying, though. Just like. I mean, hell, I mean, obviously, uh, like Jericho's matches because Jericho, you know, his stuff is a lot, is almost married to WWE or whatever else, or whatever else. Like, even when he does it or whatever else, it's, it's always good. But like, you pretty much the only person that was really doing it, um, in AEW. So like, I, I just think that like, if one other person does, I don't know if like, that's what Claudia will continue to do, but it's almost like, him and Hager had their idea of what their match was going to be back in 2014, and they never got a chance to do that match. Like, and get, you know, X amount of time to do it on a pay-per-view or whatever else. And they were like, remember that match we planned on doing almost a decade ago? Let's just do it here. That's mm-hmm. almost what it felt like. I think these two and guys... Zeb Coulter probably... was, was uh, 2.0, <laughs> basically. Or 2.0 was Zeb Coulter with the interference. They, um kind of looked at like what they had and you know they were like yo let's stick to the to the script no need to reinvent the wheel right uh and they brought uh i think they brought ross out by this point and yeah right was, and i right before that happened because you know he had to call his you know his fellow Oki. so 
Yeah. So um, after that, Hook was backstage, and he they asked him if he was ready to go. Quick okay. thing, and we'll get to it later in the show. This crowd compared to the average AEW crowd stunk. It did. Yeah. Um, some of their small towns in the south tend to not come through well. Uh, this has been something I've like noticed, like yeah, in the smaller cities that they've gone to. And it's really like, missed too when it happens. Like, there's no real explanation, like other than I can tell, like just Georgia just doesn't. Like Duluth didn't really work, and they're going there uh, this coming week. Next week, yeah, right. Yeah. And then um, Savannah did, wasn't working, but like when they were in Alabama, they were hot. When they were in um, Mississippi, Houston, North Mississippi, Houston is Mississippi, one of the Houston, hottest. Yep. When they're in, they when they're in Texas, period. Yep. When they're in Texas, period, they're hot. Like when they were in um, South Mississippi, right next, to, like right below Memphis, like they were hot. Nash- like Nashville was great. Yeah, it's yeah. So it's real hit and miss on trying to figure out. I, I remember you said uh, that when they were in Columbus, South Carolina, um, it wasn't really going either. Um, yep. So it's kind of weird because when they're, I mean, obviously, you know, the South, whatever, like, but when they're, you know, Jacksonville was always great. Orlando, they're great. When they were in, we haven't seen Tampa yet, but we know why they're not in Tampa. They're kind of locked out. But like when they go yeah. to Miami for, you know. Um, what is it? Uh, I'm not bash at the beach. What do they call the Miami shows? Road Rager, I believe. Road Rager. They didn't do yeah. a, a beach theme one like they, before the Jericho Cruise a couple years ago. They did one down there. Yeah, it like, was like they're the great Miami is my point because that's when they did the uh that one show they had the pre show they had like the Moriarty and Moriarty and um and fish match and then they had a the Suzuki Danielson match like they're they were great in Miami too. So it's and obviously you know the South Miami whatever, whatever but like. Just it's all we're still trying to figure this out on where they're hot and where they're not uh, in some of these like uh, smaller cities. So it's interesting to see because like all like another one, one that's not the South, but like Rochester's kind of weird, too. So is Milwaukee. Which is weird because they were good like, one time and one time they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So trying to figure all that out. I like remember there when Giannis was there for that like Luch, or that Luch Rose match. He was going crazy sitting there watching that shit like. That was a good crowd. It's yeah. So in the last time where it wasn't that great, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Um, after that, Hook was backstage. Got asked if he was going to go for a championship, considering he's undefeated. Just kind of walked away. He smirked um, and walked away. <laughs> Do you, flashing the charisma. So it's another one where it's like he was at a certain level. And it seems like there, there's no, like, what's the second step or what's the next step for him? Because right now, like, it seems like they're almost like maybe they've gotten rid of the Dan Hal- or the hook housing thing already. Um, so I'm wondering <laughs> where we go. Like, do we put him back with his dad? Like, it, it's kind of weird because, like, you know, you have Taz on commentary and then, like, Team Taz is like, it's just all loosely affiliated now at this point. Mm-hmm. It feels. Um, I think so putting them in segments and kind of letting them like interact, and then like kind of nudging like Ricky Starks doesn't really respect Hook yet. Like okay. Hook's not quite. I don't know. Like there's there's some reason. Like you know. Like eventually, I want Hook to fight Ricky Starks. Like let's just say that. Um, that makes sense. It, and Ricky Starks has, you know, a, a championship. So uh, one, he needs a win back for the family or whatever, um, you know, and stuff like that. And I think you can do it in a way to where like Hook finally, like Hook kind of notices that they're trying to like take the shine off him, like Starks and Hobbs or whatever. Mm-hmm. So um, right. can, Taz some... do, can Taz bump? <sighs> I, I don't know. Uh, I can't I, remember I, last time he ever took a bump. Yeah, I, I I don't think he can take a bump. He may be able to put somebody in the Taz mission. That's about it. Well, no, no, no. I don't mean the wrestle, but like, can they get heat on Taz when they eventually? You know, oh, they the can. Thing? Yeah, they can. They can put him on the ground already, and then cut no, no, no. Or <laughs> I know they can do the fake one or whatever. I was thinking, you know, they basically uh, what they did. With, remember when Jericho uh, killed Nick Jackson with the with the, yeah. with the cargo bay door, and he just laying there, and there's blood, and there's fake blood everywhere. It's like, no, nah, I, I don't want one of those. I want I want to see some real live action. I want to see. I want to see Taz get his he hand bust for it. I to think get his he can son take over. A, he he can take a gut punch or something. You know they can. You know hit him with the, hit him with the with the gut punch and he can keel over and be like oh and you know hit him with those Tommy Hearns punches that uh, that Tommy Hearns hit uh, Anvil Nightheart with that I, that 
Oh man, I. Somebody you, in our in our thread, on our group thread, sent a video of I guess they were in Detroit. Yeah, I think they were in Joe Louis Arena, and Tommy Hearns is there, Hitman Hearns, and obviously Brett Hitman Hart. They have a, some talk, some words over that. Brett's doing the you know I think it's ninety seven, so I gives lets you know what it was, and calls calls him like had it because it's how it's, it's like second version of Hart Foundation. Night Hart's in there trying to separate them, and Hearns. Hits these terrible gut punches and not hard, and not hard doubles over has to sell them terrible looking fucking things. And I was sitting there just like, and I ended up t- talking to Josh about it, just like, yeah, man, like it's it, there's there's got to be something to like real fu- like shoot fighters throwing work punches and them like just being like one or two different things. And two was like, I don't want to actually hurt the dude, so I got to throw this pillow this, this fucking pillow at somebody. And then it's like, I gotta sell this bullshit. Right. Fine, whatever. Not hard. I they know, always not hard. go down. Yeah, not hard. Not hard. He 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 couldn't have been happy. He couldn't have been happy watching that shit back. He's like, look at this shit. This motherfucker went out there and made um uh made Hagler uh piss blood after after this fight. And look what he hits me with, with this fake looking shit. Like just do yep. it for real. I would have took one for the team. Damn. <laughs> It ain't like Nightheart would have felt it. Um, oh man! Speaking of that, I was thinking about how great Bret Hart is. Uh, the other day, I was like, "This man had a main event match." So you was Willie acting Stadium. like Dax Harwood? Yes, he uh, in CM Punk in, uh, in in hair, and I was like, "Hey, Bret Hart." I was because I was uh, thinking about uh, oh, this is what it was with British Bulldog. I was like, "It's because yeah, I know you talk talk about how like uh, Macho Man." Like Macho Man was like the first like white person that you thought was black or some shit yes. like that, and I yes. was like, I was like, I think myself like, who was the first person to wrestle that ever got me when I was young? And I was like, probably British Bulldog because of them braids. <laughs> so, so then I started thinking to myself like, that's fucking crazy because like the first like match I remember actually being like, that's a great match was uh, SummerSlam '92, and then I thought to myself, you know how cold Bret Hart has to be. This man said, I don't care. If, if my dumb brother-in-law is out here recouping after getting high the night before, I'm going out here and I'm having a fucking banger in front of thousands, thousands dozens of thousands of people, whatever else. Like, you know how cold it is? It, yes, I'm, I'm fucked. I'm fu- you know how cold you got to be to say, hey, I'm going to go out here and have one of the better matches of the decade when a person is going through a crack load. Man. That's cold, bro. <laughs> that is cold. Brent, like, I remember you talking about... uh. The Tom McGee lost videotape where Kit, where uh, Walt Waltman says like Bret Hart is every bit as good as everyone says he is. Yeah, yeah. Bret Hart was out here carrying people with the four star matches that, that coming off crack lows or, com- right. or coming off crack high. That's ridiculous. Right. When, you, when you think about the 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 deep valley of talent that Bret Hart had available to him to work with, yes, it is scary. Right. You know how happy he was when he when he first met Akushi, bro. You know how happy he had to be. <laughs> well, I don't know because Bret Hart didn't really, you know, he he didn't really roll with the with the with the Mexican wrestling, the Japanese wrestling. That wasn't quite, you uh... know, you know. He used to get on Shawn Michaels for doing that Mexican wrestling, you know. <laughs> I think he. I think Bret was a lot like like the fans, where it's like the Mexicans do whatever they want to, but don't but don't dare any white or black man do that shit. I, I think it, I think it might have been that kind of nonsense. Where it's like, wait a second, the young bucks, what do they do? What are, who t- who gave them the right to wrestle like that? Like what? It's a it was on tape. I just copied what was on the tape. <laughs> what? Uh, I do I do what Ray Mysterio did. Yeah, like that's another thing with Brett. Like you ever heard Brett talk about Ray? Uh, remind me. He talks about him like he might have been the best wrestler of the nineties. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So it's like I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think it might have been the Sean thing and whatever. I don't know. Oh man, um, there, there was, I believe, a Sean Michaels and Bret Hart rivalry, like some type of documentary thing came out with them recently, and I think WWE tried to rewrite the the screw job again. Um, so I'd have to get the details on it, but it's bullshit. Let's just say that. Um, after that. Uh, we had a video package uh, recapping 
Miyu Yamashita's victory over Thunder Rosa in Japan. Um, that was a really good match. If you guys yep. hadn't seen it, they put it on AEW Dark. If you don't have Wrestle Universe, you can watch for free on YouTube. Uh, Miyu got the win, uh, kind of like uh, she reversed uh, a leverage pin. Miyu, on Rosa. Miyu at the end had Thunder Rosa on the ropes. Thunder Rosa s- escaped a move and went for a, a inside cradle in um, as she got to two um, me, you reverse it and uh, and got the reverse the and got the pin leverage on uh, Rosa and got the win. Yeah, yeah, pretty good match. Me was looked pretty dominant, I'd say throughout. It Rosa fought back and kind of knew she was in there with somebody that you know either she had to fight or she was just going to get swallowed essentially. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to hear anything bad about Thunder Rosa's working ability uh, after watching this match. So, um, after that. Uh, Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm are backstage. Thunderstorm. Uh, she said, Me you earned a- Yep. Uh, Me you earned a title match, but in the meantime, Thunderstorm is ready to take on anybody. Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter walked up. Britt said, AEW is a disaster without her. Um, and then she was like, uh, Rebel, come on in. And then Rebel comes out with a sandbag, hands that shit to Tony Giovanni. And uh, she's basically like, you know, good luck carrying this shit for a month or some shit like that. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I was I, I was wondering I was like all right so what does this mean like in storyline right and I was like that's dumb like there was like before I heard, I saw like a post on Twitter that kind of made it click for me I was like I see no benefit to this right and then they were like oh you know what do you do for a big thunderstorm you need a sandbag i was like yeah to oh. stop from flooding yeah, yeah i i got that but the only reason why I, she's doing it is because of the sandbag stuff from a, couple, a few weeks ago with her and marina shafir and thunder rosa like if not for that joke she if not for that whole drama she never brings out the sandbag ever for AEW television so i, I like i get it and it's a double entendre and it, it's but the thing for me is like I don't like this kind of stuff, and you know I don't like this kind of stuff, because, like, you're reminding us that it's fake. Like, A, we're about to have another fake fight, and I'm going to now base it around the part where, like, I don't like the part where you don't go up easy for me, like, when we have our fake fight. Like, uh, please, stop. Like, in Britt Baker, it's not like it's the worst thing in the world, but she has done stuff like this where she talks about, like, the the needling you with stuff, uh, like... With the truth. I or get, like or, or something the, the, like the backstage truth where yeah, it's like, yeah. um, like when she cut the one promo talking about like, I should be like, pres- I should be the next champion because like I do better quarter hours than everyone else or something of not that like specifically, but like something of that ilk where she's like, I, I draw better ratings on television than everyone else. I should therefore be champion. It's like, that's not, that is kind of how this works as far as like the building the fight game that gets you, uh, you know, title shots being more or whatever else. But like, what about the part where like, you got to put somebody's shoulders on the mat or you got to make somebody tap out. Like you was on, like you were losing to everyone else. That was a big, uh, you know, it was a big deal at the time in the division. That's dumb. Don't mention that part. Like, where, like, what are you do? Like, that's some, I, I'm not going to say someone's name disparage. I'm not even going to do that. There's plenty of UFC fighters that draw big, that have drawn big numbers that have been really big to contenders, be- or whatever else. I'm not going to get into it, but there's like, I, I, to be I, fair, it, it she's not the only one. That, she she's not the only one that's, that's done this. MJF, Jericho right. had a whole gimmick, the demo god. Like it's all like right. you know in there. But so. at least Jericho was like the champion who was doing demo god. He was the champion, and he won every and he won every single match when he was doing it. Like when she was doing it, it's not it, it's not much. It's not, it doesn't make much of a difference. Like uh, I just I just don't like when people do this. Like, Demo God is at least like, oh, you're just poking fun at it, as opposed to like, literally like, stare at it and there's nothing else you can mention because I'm talking about it. Uh, like, MJF saying, you know who's number two in, in the ratings? That's right, me. You dare call me a professional because I didn't show up to a, to a thing that fans bought tickets for and then I no showed? Yeah, we are, asshole. Like, so anyway, like, that's, that's a whole different point. But like, I just don't like people do that kind of stuff because it's like, I don't know what service it actually points. Like, does it actually make people more interested in wanting to see this person's next thing on television? I don't think it does, really. So, um, 
so I just kind of see it like it, it, sir, it's kind of uh, unnecessary. So I don't know. Yeah, um, there is some uh, scuttlebutt that these two ladies do not enjoy each other's company um, <laughs> out of storyline. So uh, sometimes it results in, you know, uh, the on-screen product going going up and then sometimes it you know is the opposite so i don't know which way it's gonna gonna lean with this i think overall in the rivalry they've had positive results uh, with that but uh you know brit without the championship i think she's got to kind of find her way to kind of really connect again because you know her her unit was very long in the tooth when she lost the title they Mm -hmm. still kind of have them largely in the same like there's nothing different about them yet Right, I would um, like them to. I would like Brit to be a baby face, like do every all the things she's already does, except like don't cheat, don't have all your matches in the same way. If someone runs out, and like just let people cheer you because they already do anyway, and like you might be able to get oh, some, yeah, it might, you might be able to get some heels over. Yeah, by by the way, she um is, she is the uh, I think like the. I, I don't know who to compare her to, but if you listen to Twitter about Britt Baker, you would think this is like the worst wrestler to enter the business. Every single person hates her. No, every building she's in, she gets mega reactions. Still yeah. very popular. Does ratings. Uh, does ratings. Uh, I don't know what the fuck y'all talk about. Just <laughs> you know, this, this narrative that people make it up about her. So um, I think people are I think people are sick of the act. Yeah. And to be fair, yeah. like they have, they have, they have uh, gotten Ran every drop of juice down. out. Of, they've gotten every drop of juice out of that one already. Uh, it feels. Yeah. So after that, we had Serena Deeb and Anna J, and it was in kind of Anna J's home area. I thought this was shockingly solid. Um, I this is the best match I've ever seen for Anna J for sure. Hmm. Uh, and this is better no, than that when she did. I, I think it was better than that Brandy Rhodes match. No, 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 no. Once she in that that hardcore match where like the bunny bladed and yes, and but this is a singles match. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, like her best singles match, I'll say that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and this was you know it was pretty cool. Um, I thought I thought Deeb looked solid here, and she obviously needed to win uh to to get it going before uh the ROH uh, women's title match. She's gonna be fighting Mercedes Martinez. Uh, she put her in the serenity lock for the win. Uh, yeah. I would say this was uh, like NJ gets a lot of shit on Twitter too. They, I think a lot of people were trying to be um, a lot closer to wrestling than they think they or than they have the right to. Uh, then when they're trying to police people's training habits and things like that, and you know wanting to see them working more places, uh, I think she kind of you know held held her own here. Yeah, I thought it was fine. Um, I, I thought it. I thought at times, um, Anna looked on point. Other times, she didn't throw out the match. Um, I don't know if technical wrestling necessarily suits her the best. She might just be better at running and striking. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I thought that the match was. Per- I thought the match was perfectly fine. So um, we had Jade Stokely and the baddies backstage. Uh, once again, I feel like I've seen this segment. Yeah, they're stuck and they're right. kind of stuck. Like, what's next? Where are you going to get to? Yeah. It? Like, it's almost like they're waiting on somebody. Somebody hurt that they're waiting to right. spring. Uh, oh, uh, Red Velvet's hurt. Red she? Velvet's hurt. Or are they, they waiting? Her. Are they waiting for somebody to arrive? I, I don't know her injury, so I'm not okay. sure. Uh, it, but yeah, can it we turn like, the key on this? Yeah, it seems like they've been waiting a long time to get to wherever they're trying to get at with, uh, her name's Casey, right? Casey, you mean Layla Gray? Layla, God, I did it again. Damn it! Yeah, Layla Gray. Sure. I, 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 look, man, the beige. It happens. It happens sometimes. I'm sorry. I know I'm being, you know, uh, dehumanizing by mixing up these two people's names. But I'm sorry. Like, all I don't know them that intimately well. Uh, so anyway, uh, Layla. It seems like ever since the, the Layla and the um. Uh, Statlander and Athena thing, it seems like they've been like waiting to get to some sort of match, but it's like, it, when is it going to happen and when are you going to get to it? And like, Athena's been around, feels like over a month now. 
Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it hasn't been two months, but it, she's been a, she's been around. It's like they've been circling the Jay stuff, circling uh, Jay with Statlander, and like we haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and I don't think anything has been necessarily that interesting to be able to hold us over for as long as this has been going. So I kind of hope that they pull the trigger and get to it already. For sure. Um, it doesn't help that they had to build a pay per view where like they had no, they couldn't. They had nothing to do with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, from there, we had the announcements for Rampage and also uh, next week's uh, Dynamite and Death for Dishonor. So uh, I guess we can go through. I mean, you're going to talk about those in a little bit. Uh, Death for Dishonor, I'll run it down real quick. Uh, Willow Uta versus Daniel Garcia for the pure title. FTR and the Briscoes did an awesome uh, six minute sit down uh, that was on um, Twitter. Um, and they're going to be was fighting. Was it on AEW's for- YouTube? I think it is on there. Oh, um, it is. Yep. Interesting. And um, it is a two out of three falls match now. So um, Samoa Joe and Jay Lethal for the ROH World Television title. Saves Martinez and Serena Deeb. And Jonathan Gresham versus Claudio Casignoli for the ROH World title. So Sounds like uh, a fun show. Yeah. Sounds like a, like a pretty good show. Um I would have Claudio Castanoli uppercut Jonathan Gresham's head to the fourth row, but that's just me. Um, you know, if you're relaunching ROH, I, I would probably, you know, grab the belt back and, you know, place it over to Mr. Uh, Castanoli. I mean, I mean, there's reasons why there's, there's reasons to do it. I, um, like it seemed as if Escalador was telling a story about Claudio during the show about like how he he had never won the uh, he, I think it was he never won a singles belt in Ring Honor. Um, so I mean there is a there is a you know a subtle story in that and if you you know cu- you know a person that was a, a bit of a standout there for a certain amount of time he comes back and you know um, achieves that um, and then with him I think you can have more marketable matches to try to sell pay-per-view because he has credibility of being on WWE and, you know, having moments in WrestleMania, that sort of stuff. And, um, he's over, but, uh, I don't know. Like if it, it, it like, it feels like almost too easy. And now I'm getting like WWE brain of like, that's too easy. You don't want to take the layup. Do you? It was like, well, yeah, you should. That's good booking. But it's like, if they if they have the stomach for it, like I wouldn't mind if like uh, they got more heat on Gresham and um, and Tully and, and his group by like them cheating to keep the hoard the title and then like they get back to um, Claudio winning it again. But then it's like, well, he's out of WWE for like a month. And you're already having him lose. I don't. It, it's it, that one's there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's not. Here. I mean, you. I mean, they're probably just gonna have Claudio win, and I'm gonna be looking, and we're gonna look back like in uh, next show, and be like, oh, of course, they, they, that's the right thing. But like, I don't think it's necessarily like the easiest thing in the world to say, hey, uh, you were the champion of this promotion as it was going down, and you decide to commit to stay around for the rebirth of this thing, and we're gonna take the belt right off of you. Like, just it, like it, it does. Like, regardless of how people feel about Gresham's style of wrestling and how him and his wife uh, behave on Twitter, whatever. Um, but like, yeah, it, it, it's you know. Um, We'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Cause like, we'll see what happens. Cause like, I think that I, cause do you really want Samoa Joe and Claudia to be the champions in 2022 and in, re, in the relaunch ring honor when like that, when that could be, it, it could be any, at this point, it could be anything it wants to be. I don't know. Like, what do you want the identity ideally, of the show to be? Like, I think ideally you want to get a, a young wrestler to rise right. through, the, through the ranks in Ring right. of Honor. And, and I don't think Gresham's that guy either. No, like, but I, no, like, that's I'm true. thinking some, somebody that's like, he almost feels almost like in a way like all this new in uh, NWA, where it's like he's standard bearer, but like, all right, when are we going to move on and like get somebody to, you know, carry the torch? Like, you know, told his torch forever. <clears throat> all right. And I, I would, you know, I'm looking at, you know, people like, that that are around like Takesha, like Garcia, that are Willer Yuta, um, Dante Martin, that's hanging around. You know, under twenty five guys that that are there that 
can rise through the ranks uh, up there. So that's what I would. That's my long term goal for them. I think you can use your Joes or your Claudios to certify those those guys uh, once they've you know done their reign and and all that. So um, after yeah. that, we had the AW World Tag Team Championships, Swerve and Our Glory taking on the Young Bucks, who are the defending champions, and Ricky Sta- Ricky Starks and Powerhouse Hobbs. Um, were you about this- to say it like how uh, Taz says it? Yes. Okay. Starks. Gotcha. Um, this was an incredible match that we could have seen at PWG. Uh, remember all the stuff we were saying about the crowd really not being you know great uh, for tonight, well, they arrived uh, in the main event for sure, um, and it just like kept escalating and escalating and getting more creative and more creative and like just bigger spots, uh, more uh, kind of like just twists and turns. And uh, this was a, a shocking result, I would say. Um, and you know, through different like reporting, I've I've seen it seems like the Bucks weren't really meant to have these belts anyway because there was, you know, the whole thing with the Hardys, but the, the it was always going to Swerve and Lee, some say. So, uh, but they win it here. Uh, what I felt like is a complete surprise. Crowd went crazy at the finish. I went crazy at the finish. I would, you know, let's fucking go Swerve, like loud as hell. Um, I was I was very excited um, seeing, you know, Swerve and Lee with the belts, knowing what both of those guys uh, have gone through in the past year with being released from WWE, both of them, uh, you know, different trials and tribulations in their personal lives to make it back here. And this was this was just an excellent match. Like I would probably go four and three quarters on this. Um, I, I I just uh, there was uh, the the part towards the end where Swear was going to hit him with the belt. I was like I, I didn't quite know what was Same. going on. I figured Same. it was I figured it was something that w- that could be explored later. Like you know I, like because I you know I've kind of looked at these guys like yo I think they're doing a Kenny and Hangman style story with them. Like I think they're going to have like a long run together and then do a big breakup. And, um, you know, I could be wrong, but uh, this was, you know, regardless of what what's coming in the future, this match was excellent. Add another one to the Young Bucks reel. Um, Starks and Hobbs, I think, you know, had a lot of people wanting it to go their way as well. So, um, but yeah, I can't say enough good things about uh, the, the interactions between Swerve and Nick. Uh, I thought were excellent. Uh, I thought Hobbs like upped his 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 rate like you know of him, what he normally does. Him hitting ring. like a million uh, spine busters by throwing people on top of Keith Lee is like the coolest thing he's ever done in pro wrestling. Yeah, that and, awesome. and it, that and then he you know the big splash across the ring like it was like man this guy's like you know get he's he's becoming more impressive because um, mm. he's you know he's kind of just a, you know like his name says a powerhouse wrestler like he's not like really like wowing you with like uh you know his, his but, like but athletics or anything right. but that's like but, you know but that's the thing when it comes to like if you're actually in fat an actual powerhouse right like a like a okay so for example another person that's a perfect example of this drew mcintyre think of all the stuff he does in a match that like 20 years ago, guys his size, they would have told him, never do this kind of shit, right? <laughs> don't do a flip dive. Don't kip up. You don't, don't, don't do X, Y, and Z, right? But the thing is, like, because, you know, the idea is, and if one gigantic guy has to do it, then all the other gigantic guys have to do it or whatever else. And they want to do as little shit as possible 20 years ago when they were stealing our money. Uh, so... But the thing is, if you are, in fact, athletic and powerful, well, power is strength plus speed. So he sh- so if you are, in fact, a real life powerhouse, you should be possess the ability to launch your body and leap and be explosive. So him being a uh, being able to do a um, uh, a frog splash two thirds uh, away across the ring that actually fits in character with what he's doing like he's. You know what? What do you think he did? What do you think he's in the weight room doing on squats for? You know what I'm saying? Like, it may, <laughs> like they say they tell you not to do that stuff, but there's no reason why he sh- why he can't do that. I'm not saying he needs to come out here and do it again. He does, I'm not saying he's come out here and be Ninja Mac, but like a dive, yeah, go for it. 
Yeah, um, and I, I think that's like something to, to you know keep for these these big matches. I thought Starks, uh, you know, pl- kind of playing off the Bucks uh, with the with the the rope yeah. walking, and then yeah. also being in the middle of their pose, and, they and then they, they super kick the shit out of them. Like, hey, man, like you, you come in the middle of this pose, that that ain't for you, uh, Playboy. So you know, you know what that reminded me of. What? So you know that you know they they love themselves some Brett and they love themselves some Sean. It reminded me of like when when Sean was like in NWA for NWO for a day and he was like, <laughs> "There's there's something wrong about this picture." And he and then he super kicked uh, Booker T. It was yeah. like, "Oh, y'all double super hit the black." Okay, I see. Yep. I see. Yep. I see. I, I, I see. I see you. I see you. But uh, uh, it's in all seriousness, like. Um, I did not go as high as you did on this match. I thought the beginning of it kind of was a, not as what happens with like the Luch- with uh, Young Bucks matches. Like they're normally so on point all the time in everything in their matches, like work like clockwork. And sometimes when it doesn't work at a hundred percent synchronization, sometimes it can look kind of not not rough. That's too harsh of a word, but not perfect, right? Their matches are perfect, right? Everything's planned to be perfect. Sometimes when it's not perfect, it sticks out. And then they kept going so goddamn long that it was like, never mind that first. Never mind the first third. Never mind. Shut that, up. Never, never mind that first forty. <laughs> never mind that first forty sec. Forty percent of the match. Like worry about this last sixty. And like, I, I I was really impressed with some of the stuff they came up with and some of the stuff they did. And <clears> like, <throat> I thought the I thought they had a perfect finish uh, the first time. Um, it looked like. Swerve and uh, Keith Lee were going to win. Um, it like like the crowd popped for it. They were hot for the finish, and they kicked out, and they went around the loop again with near falls for other, other teams, and they finally came back and got to Swerve and Keith Lee. Uh, great match. I just wish that, you know, I hadn't been spoiled on the fucking thing. Uh, thanks, Caleb. There's, yeah. I, fi- I find new ways to get spoiled on shit, bro. New ways. New ways. I didn't even click on a thread on Facebook Messenger to get spoiled. I just go to like go to a different thread and I see like in the thing that for some that that Caleb had just said the Bucks lost the belts and I see it in bold like not actually clicked into the thing just in the in the number of messages I'm like yeah God damn like they I keep finding new ways to get spoiled on shit that sucks it really does it's not his fault at all it's just like. That's just the way the game goes. That's just the way the game goes. That one sucked yeah. though, but that but so, it was a great match. I give it easily four and a half though. Yeah, yeah. They um, uh, the Bucks come off the belts here, and you know we were on the show, obviously thinking there was yeah. a Bucks FTR. That is uh, the one match. downer. We were wrong, we were wrong as fuck. We were wrong as uh, fuck. Yeah, rare rare time on one nation radio. No rare um, time. So <laughs> you know I go through these shows every year to make a best of. We be wrong. Like we're not wrong I, all I the time, but we are regularly this. we are regularly wrong. I know you're doing your gimmick where we're never wrong, but I think I, okay, go ahead, Rich, go ahead. Get I, your, I, I don't get recall off this. Um, I matter of fact, I, you know, I may have to scrub uh, last week's show from the or whatever show from that stop being dumb around. We're gonna have to scrub that from the archives. I don't want nobody trying to trying to that's, uh, that's bring really it back nice to the light you, on us. Because I'm the one that said stop being dumb. It wasn't even you. It was See? me. You know, just, just protecting the brand. You know, it's just. <laughs> But uh, very transparency was that yes, very happy uh, personally for Swerve. Uh, I've you know spent many hours talking about wrestling with him, and um, you know really happy to see uh, you know how he's coming to the company, gotten over big, been over pretty much from day one. Uh, it's gotten over with his wrestling and obviously his persona, and then uh, him and Lee have kind of found something as a team and. I'm not sure where, which way it goes uh, for those guys. I kind of like the Shaq and Kobe dynamic they got going on. And um, did you I, see the confetti color? Uh, I didn't notice the confetti color. It was purple and gold. Look at them! Look at them! The, the small details. I, I, I think I was too like in, in celebration mode and you know tweeting and um, you know talking about how WWE wanted to end Keith Lee's career by giving him uh, uh, the Bearcat Wright gimmick and how they wanted to fire Swerve a month into his uh, main roster uh, run. Like I, I was too uh, turned up uh, to to basically notice uh, the colors there, but um, yeah. Never forget, WWE tried to get both of these guys out of there. And, you know, I once went on Twitter and said, yo, it's not like somebody's like a, uh, you know, like 
like I'm looking at it like and I did like a long tweet thread and it was one of those discussions about black wrestlers in AEW and stuff like that. And uh, it's definitely not perfect, but I, I, I actually cited like Swerve and Ricochet. I was like, yo, there's not a Swerve slash Ricochet level guy that is like being turned away in AEW and like, you know, it has no shot at, at, at breaking through and then. Mm-hmm. Within months, uh, Swerve's like, you know, shows up and has a belt on. It's like, oh, like all, all these people that were doing all this, all this cap and everything like that and putting koofies on Vince McMahon should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, I think that these two bring something wholly unique promo wise, working wise, where they can wrestle the speed teams, they can wrestle the power teams, they can you know, face mis- mix match teams like, you know, like your Starks and your Hobbs or, you know, I'd love to see a rematch with the Bucks. I don't know which way it's all going to go, but um, this was a surprise that worked for me a lot because it's like, oh, this is what we're doing. Fuck it. Like, it, it works. It, it rides. Let it ride. To be fair, the only thing I did not like about this match was the part we was wrong as fuck. That's, that's it. That's it, because I, I, I really wanted to see a third uh, Young Bucks and FTR match at uh, towards the end of the year. But I mean, outside of that, whatever. Um, like brings new life into the division on top. Uh, I think it also frees up the Young Bucks who <clears throat> kind of makes me think like I guess maybe like Kenny is kind of feeling better and it might be time for the trio stuff to unload and and you know because we've been holding off like the Adam Cole and Hangman and. Uh, dragon. I was like dragon, red dragon stuff, and all that, all of that stuff, all of that, you know, elite or uh, unspeeded elite stuff with Hangman. Like they've been, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting to do it, and it seems like you know it's c- kind of similar to like my you winning SWA belt is like, all right, st- th- seems like things are starting to be put in motion to you know open this thing up. So, um, you know, I hate being wrong. Y'all know this. I hate being wrong. Um, but. Like, I, I I think we're headed towards you know a lot of fun stuff this. coming down the line. I'll take this and like um I think that these guys, as you mentioned, freshens up the division and kind of creates like a like a new hierarchy within it. Um, like obviously you know you have the Bucks, you have FTR, um, you got Lucha Brothers, like well established. You add these guys in, um, Hobbs and Starks have picked up steam of course like uh 2.0 is like picked up steam within you know the jericho group uh any type of tag combination that bcc rolls out um there's just a lot you know you think about like the the teams that are kind of like been out the way like Jurassic express no longer here uh pmp is kind of like not around anymore so it's like well, those teams kind of need to get replaced yeah the pmp thing is more is because of uh ortiz who i heard he was out for a long time or, or santana, santana. Yeah. yeah i heard he's out for a long time yeah. Do we know so, what the injury actually is, or just like he's blood his knee and you, you know he's gonna be yep. gone for almost a year? Yep. That sucks. Yep. Um, so lots of stuff in this match. Um so I, I saw Matt Jackson lose the shoe, so that was also another uh tip that maybe the Bucks like, you know, we were losing or, you know, um The shoes cause... are like hair like Samson's hair, give them strength. So, like, the last, like, three kind of title matches the Bucks have been in, um, like, you can flash back to the first FTR match. Like, they lost a shoe, won. Right. Um, they lost the, the, the shoe, or they took the shoe off and against the Lucha Brothers. Right. They lost. And then they took the, the shoe off again here. So, the shoe gives and the shoe takes us away, depending on the, the story. It's all shoe-based. So, like... The, the Matt Jackson shoe lore. So, yes. like, so the shoe is all Matt... Every time it's been Matt Jackson... I believe is Matt every so, time. So this is like, so the shoe is like Triple H Sledgehammer. This part of the character is the shoe. <laughs> the character work. You saw, you saw how Barry character worked the other day, right? Bro. I was screaming. <laughs> have, you, have you out here look like a damn dummy? You better stop. It's a fight. You better stop at it like it's fight. not. I'm going to get your ass up. Yes. Get your ass up. I'm not, I'm not even gonna go into the rant. I'm not gonna give you a rant. I'm just gonna move on because there's a lot of stuff to get to. But I had, I have a good one. I have a good one. I have a good one. Um, but okay, so drivers who switch and save with Progressive save over seven hundred dollars on average, and those savings add up. Imagine what you could buy in the future. So I used the savings from switching to Progressive thirty years ago to buy tickets to the championship game. You know, between those two teams that didn't exist thirty years ago. 
Yeah, I'm a big Alaska Palm Trees fan. Which is a team now? In the future? So switch to Progressive and save big because those savings can add up in the future. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive in 2020. Potential savings will vary. I guess on to Rampage, and I guess we can move by on Rampage quickly because this was one of the worst Rampages ever. Ever. I, I, I skipped Rampage on, oh like, at the God. last moment. Like, I, I kind of just was, uh, I had actually had a conversation, like, with my dad, and I was talking to uh, Catherine about it, and I just, you know, kept talking to Catherine. Like, and I was like, mm. you know what? I'll just catch it another time. But then, brother, like, if you want to invest that hour, because it's just an hour, go for it. But, uh, like, Look, hope did that. So hopefully, you ain't got to go through that. I watched that shit now, you know, because I watched them back to back, and I was like, man, like, what, you know, watching the Orange Cassidy and Warlow match from from Dynamite, and then seeing the main event, and I was like, you know, and, and everything between for those two hours watching that that Dynamite, I was like, this crowd, not finna go now. Like, think, imagine like it's gonna be a third hour. I know they, I know they added, you know. They did a whole bunch of audio sweetening to make try to make this show seem like they gave a fuck, and then like the matches, and I was like, I saw the match, I was like, oh man, like there ain't no ain't no way to not touch this audio, ain't no way. Uh, so like I I mean I I don't have the rundown of the promos and stuff, or whatever, but I have the match matches or whatever else. So um, then opening with Malachi Black and Brody King versus Silver and Reynolds, and it started just in the ring, right? And, like, a lot of it was, they were building towards Silver versus Brody, and, you know, obviously, it, 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 it gave a lot of the vibe of, like, Hameka versus Ida, where it's, like, Big Hoss versus Lil Hoss, and Lil Hoss gotta let Big Hoss know he gotta feel it eventually. Um, and then they use a lot of double double moves, or double teaming moves with strikes to try to get um, Brody King off balance. Um, and they did like the first time it didn't work, then the second time it did. But ultimately, uh, by the end, uh, they got Reynolds isolated and then they end up hitting the Dante's Infernal on him. I, this is three stars. It was, a, it was just a good match, just a flatly good match. It wasn't like Silver, you know, did all the Silver stuff and it wasn't like, you know, Malachi went crazy and did a bunch of stuff, but just a fine match. Um, then the next match is Jonathan Gresham and uh, Lee Moriarty, and I noticed when Lee Moriarty came out, like, and he's always done this ever since he's been in AEW, is he comes out with a baseball jersey, and he has a decorative mask, and he takes off and walks down to the ring, and I guess because this, this, like, mask was yellow this time, and the jet, and the jersey was yellow, it stuck out to me, and it was like, because I know he watches Joshi, I thought to myself, oh, he's, he's doing, he's doing Queen's Quest cosplay, He's been doing it all this time. I don't even think my fucking nose ever realized it. He's coming out with a baseball jersey. He has decorative mask. He takes off the Russells or whatever. I was like, this be like this man is an EO Shirai mark from 2018 or 2016 to till he, she left for WWE. So, um, they have the match and like the it's the wrestling is very good. The technical wrestling aspect of it, and this is better than that Battle of the Belts match. That uh, that, that was Dalton Castle donk. Right, that's just a flat ass three star match. This match was better. The problem is this match. I don't know if it's a problem, but like the crowd was more into Moriarty. And keep in mind, they're in Savannah, Georgia, and Gresham is from Atlanta. Um, and I don't think this was intentional. Um, but the match is good. They do, uh, but the thing is, like. They're telling the story that Moriarty can actually like. They're trying to tell you that Gresham is the best technical wrestler in the world, and then Moriarty, then like, can hold up with him technically at certain points. And but then ultimately, when it comes down to it, is like Moriarty can throw dynamic strikes, and Gresham had. Caprice Coleman told a story saying he had a glass jaw, and I was like. You're saying that your world champion has a glass jaw? I don't know. I get why you're saying it, but I don't know about this one, bro. So, but it, that's what that's was what was happening. Uh, Moriarty. That is very back. interesting. Right, Moriarty was getting back into it by throwing dynamic strikes, and Gresham had trouble with it. Um, and so like, what would happen is uh, maybe, maybe have, that's his maybe that's his version of like Zack Saber Jr. being susceptible to strikes and shit. Right, right, right. Or like Danielson, whenever he wrestles um another talented grappler, like. 
he will put over the other person's grappling, and then he will come back to the match tactically by going to strikes, right? Same like uh, the Drew Gulak and um, Daniel uh, Bryan match from was it 2020 before the pandemic. Like that was a perfect example of like of that, right? Um, but you're right. It, Saber does do that as well. Um, but ultimately, <sighs> they end up in a match where, like, you know, obviously he turned on him a couple weeks ago. They do the code of honor, the handshake. Warrior doesn't want to give him the handshake. They wrestle. Like, I, I, all the stuff it's, I, I just mentioned. And then between, and in the middle of the match, uh, they, uh, Tully gets a, a distraction. Then he distracts the ref. I'm sorry. And then, Gresham like looks at the at the hard cam, and then like it looks at and then smiles and then just Jimmy taps uh Moriarty and then takes over from there and I was like oh man oh. like I, I understand he's a heel now but like I would have liked for y'all to have made this man look impressive and like the thing is like this match was really good I gave it three and a quarter but like it felt like it went like eight minutes and like Moriarty's more over in here in Georgia. And like, it was just a lot of stuff that I just felt like, is he a ring honor champion or not? Are y'all tra- like, there is like, he has the belt, but they have done nothing on a W television to present a Jonathan Gresham or quite frankly, any of the, any of the ring of honor people outside of Samoa Joe as like reasons for to care about these people. Like they don't come out and they don't let they give them the space, uh, to go have a dynamic match. And, I take that back. I also throw Lethal in there because, but Lethal got over before there was Ring of Honor that we knew he was going back to Ring of Honor. Like they just have them going out there and they have these okay matches, um, and then they move on. And it's like, you, you, to me, like obviously we already know this, but it's like even if the names were different, if they were still, if these people were coming out here and had different, bigger star power or whatever else, and had these same matches, this would not entice you to watch Ring of Honor. Like you were watching Ring of Honor based on the fact where it's like you're you're going to you know you're going to get FTR two out of three falls match with uh, the Briscoes and that match is going to be great because they already had one of the best matches of the year earlier this year and you think they'll be able to have another one just as good or top it that is a selling point for this pay per view and I gotta say like Tony Khan is actually treating Ring of Honor the same way that like people thought he was going to treat AEW where it's like it just a, it's just a it's just a match promotion. What are they selling? Where is the where is the drama? Where is the story? Like mm-hmm. that's actually kind of what he is. What it feels like he is doing Ring of Honor right now. I think it'll change over time, but because you know, like Ring of, or AEW started with like we'll sell you big matches, then we'll tell stories or whatever else to hook you to go further into it. But man, like when you have the time, you're giving the space to like a Serena, a uh, Mercedes, uh, Samoa Joe. Dut, uh, Sing, there's people that are regularly on AEW television that are on Ring of Honor, and it's like, I don't know why these people's personalities, or or, <laughs> or these people's, uh, um, what, or what, what can, what's compelling about them right now, especially compared to what we see on AEW on, on everyday basis, so it's kind of like, I don't know, man, uh, like, I mean, I mean, I, Tully's compelling, because Tully's Tully, and Tully's been Tully for 40 fucking years, you know what I'm saying, like, it's, it's kind of, you know, um, sounds so, like they they need to switch the belt. Like <laughs> you're right, but as I also feel like, damn, y'all ain't doing him no favors neither. Like he turned him on Lee Moriarty. Like I like I like the way he wrestles, but it's like out of the killers, he's clearly four right now. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, um. You know what? But this gets to moving on from there. Then you have a, a squash match with Athena and Chris Statler versus the the Renegade Sisters, Robin and, and uh, Charlotte. I couldn't tell uh. which is which because, like, well, one of well, they they could they they their hair is almost exactly the same except for like one has parts in the other one doesn't. But like outside of that, the gear is exactly the same. So like, I didn't I couldn't tell which I don't know which one was which, but I could tell which one was which based off of just off the look of the hair. But, like, close enough, and it didn't matter because they got squashed immediately. Uh, they, like, within minutes, like, uh, I don't know what Athena's calling her the Eclipse now, but, like, she hit her with Eclipse and got the, the finish. And, like, before the bell rang, like, Chris Sadler took one of them out the ring and beat her ass. And that was quick. And then after the match, 
Um, I'm about to do it again. Uh, not Layla Gray. Layla, yes. Yeah, I was going to say not Casey. I was about to call her not Casey. Layla Gray came out and got involved, and then Jay ran down, and she like she laid out Athena and Statlander came and went back up the ring, and man, um, I don't know if you see if you saw what uh, Jay was wearing. But uh, if you want to throw on Rampage just for that, I, I mean, there have been worse reasons to throw on Rampage. There have been worse reasons to throw on Rampage. That's all I'll say. Uh, so, so, so yeah, like she got the heat on. She got her, her big heat. And um, it seemed like she is less, a little bit less wary, um, has a little bit more patience for um, Layla going uh going forward but we'll see how but it's it's a it's a very 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 slow burn it's a, it is a drip right now but uh but yeah that's going forward uh with that one um and then uh the main event was uh lucha bros versus private party and andrade when they were doing the pre-match promo uh with mark henry uh, andrade was trying to put them over and he and then uh Private Party took it over and says, "Like, man, y'all don't really, you don't really care about us. We just here, we trying to do our thing. Instead of just trying to turn back face, I think, yep. I think." Um, and they sent him out, and they sent him out there. And I got it. This might be the worst Lucha Bros match I've ever seen, which is Damn. saying something because it's like it's still three. Uh, what did I give it? No, I gave it three flat. A three right. flat Lucha Bros match. When is the last time you ever yeah. heard of that? Ever. <laughs> Sounds like a disaster. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a lot of weird. It was a lot of um, I don't know, man. It's hard to explain what happened. Like, I don't know if Phoenix went up to catch an inverted atomic drop, and then like he went down on a knee and like sold it, and like I was like, I rewound it because it's like, did he actually really fuck up his knee on a going just up and down landing like Kendrick Perkins in two thousand? Uh, 10 finals did he like blow out his knee on that or hyper extend his knee on that and I w- watched it back and like I think he extended I think he hyper extended his knee on an atomic drop and was kind of oh. done and then uh he tagged out because he was hurt and Pinto went to uh go off the top rope for a like a, a some top rope move and he slipped off the top of the fucking ropes and so the match was a mess after that and but basically by the end uh Phoenix gets back in like and just to go to the finish uh he he uh he grabs uh I think it was Isaiah Cassidy. Yeah, he grabs mm-hmm. Isaiah Cassidy. No, I'm sorry, he grabbed uh Quinn who now has a haircut. He, he has a one now. Uh he grabs him and hits him with like a Quinn has a one? Yeah. He has a normal? Yeah. Wow, yeah. he he got off the list. The list? Yeah. The list of you, what? You, you you know the list. You know, uh black wrestlers with a regular haircut list. Oh my god, I didn't know that was a list, but yeah, he's off of that now. He looks like a normal person. Uh, so he, uh, or, or in the words of my grandma, whenever you got a, got a haircut, you look like somebody. Uh, so he, uh, so Phoenix gets back in and, and be- goes straight to the finish. He ends up hitting a fire, fire miscarry into a, into a, uh, power driver. It looked devastating. I don't know what the hell he calls it, but it looked awesome. I thought he smoked Quinn. Uh, but and pinned him with that, and they got out of there, and I was like, man, like, I just watched an hour, uh, a whole solid hour of nothing but, like, a squash, a uh, three and a quarter, and a uh, 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 three and a quarter and a three. I was like, this is not the, this is not the AEW I'm accustomed to. Like, this shit would not have, this shit would not have cut it anywhere else except for WWE. Like, this well, I don't know what this was. It felt they, gross. They might be saying it was a match of the year candidate if it happened in WWE. Don't, don't go that far. Don't 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 do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, I was just I was disappointed by this rampage. I was like, man, like you tell me. I mean, a private party versus Lucha Bros. You know, I'm expecting some. I'm expecting some a great match, and I ain't get it. Not even close. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Well, that stinks. Yeah. Uh, so where do we go from here? Japan? I guess we have to take the trip over to Pro Wrestling Noah. So Okay. Uh, I will hit to- the music. Thank you. I, I already got it downloaded, so it's time to hit the music. Wow. 
We are back. Okay, so um, I'm going to pre uh, before we even get to it. I'm going to go ahead and you know uh, pour up some of this. Uh, I was on I was on uh, YouTube just going down a actually Twitter brought me to it. There was this guy. Uh, this uh, bartender that makes these like crazy drinks or whatever else, and he made a Kool Aid slushy with uh, rum in it, and I was like, I'm gonna do that. Uh, but I was like, I don't feel like freezing it, so I just made the Kool Aid and threw some liquor in here. Uh, so uh, when I start in, when I start sweating, you'll you'll know what it is. It, it is this. Uh, but man, like. I did not watch the the first couple matches. I, I just kind of skipped to the money matches, if you will. And I started with uh, Ninja Mag versus uh, Dante uh, Leon. And man, or... before you do that, Ninja Mag, a man I became aware of WrestleMania weekend 2021. Memes. Saw yeah. this like kind of not well-bodied guy right. He's coming better shape, out here man. doing these insane flips like and just getting over like in the middle of like this shit scramble match mm-hmm. and I'm like who the fuck is that guy mm-hmm. he's gonna be a star and uh, a year and a half later here is Ninja Mac yes and uh, he's in better shape now um, and he's in this match almost uh, almost basically like a, a, fat, like a, a match showcase who, who could be the next junior challenger or junior uh, heavyweight champion challenger. And um, there were so, look, move after move, incredible moves, awesome moves, so many moves. This dude, I, look, man, the kids will be wrestling like Ninja Mac. Get ready. Buckle up. The future is bright. The the future is a rich ladder approved future. Man. And I, I'm not just saying it's just him, because also the uh, the Dante Leon dude did a like off the second rope f- did a, a backflip into a cutter. RKO if whatever you want to call it. It was awesome. Uh he also he got to the top rope <clears throat> while Ninja Mac was on the floor. And he got up and this man hit a red arrow cutter. Like, imagine all the shit, the, the pot finish, except yeah. instead of a, a landing, yes, and brought him down. And, and like, I remember saying it to you, and I was like, or saying it in the third, and I was like, that's not a typo. It's not that a red arrow got countered into a cutter like some uh, Matt Bourne, uh, Randy Orton thing. No. the per- Imagine if Matt Bourne had came off with the front flip and, and the hook, bro. I, I was like, oh, my God. There was a spot where. Evan Bourne. Evan Bourne, yes, I said Matt yep. Bourne. Yeah. Different, different wrestler. So there was also a spot where Ninja Mag went to charge to the corner and Dante gave him the up and over over the ropes and he flipped over and landed on his feet like on some ricochet shit that was awesome. And then the, ca- the camera angle made it even more awesome because like he like he did it right in front of the camera. So all of a sudden like he falls and all of a sudden you see like him rise up like, oh my God, he didn't actually he landed on his feet. He didn't actually fall. This is awesome. Man, and then the finishes match off. Uh, Ninja Mag has a match one. He goes hit the finish. His finish was a Phoenix Splash. Was it, I'm sorry, a six thirty Phoenix Splash. That's that's yes. a better way to explain it. I couldn't fucking believe my eyes when I saw this shit. It's one of the most incredible moves that incredible has ever moves. been done in the history of pro wrestling. Pull up. Go into the thread, find the, uh, the, the Dave Meltzer. We are playing this before we move on. We are playing the, the incredible moves, moves after moves. Bro, I... There were there was stuff on this thing that I just not believe. I remember where I was the first time I saw a fucking regular Phoenix Splash. It was... Wor- it, I didn't... It was- that wasn't it. My bad. It guys. was Royal Rumble 2015, the triple threat match in, in, uh, between... Roman Reigns, not Roman Reigns, uh, Seth Rollins and John Cena and Brock Lesnar were Lesnar, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Reigns. I see, I'm saying Reigns. I'm sorry. Incredible moves. Incredible moves. Yes. I remember that where Seth Rollins <laughs> hits that Phoenix Splash on 
John Cena, and that's one of the best matches in WWE of the decade. And I was like, what the fuck was that? I've never seen no shit like that before. And and then flash forward to to 2022, is like, 630s are awesome and, 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 like, devastating and it seems like a, a thing where, like, you know, people that do it, like, they can go You're wrong. just in a higher tier, like... You know, it's like, you know, you're saying, like, you, you just think there's only so many of those you got in the body, right? There's only mm-hmm. so many rickish, uh, times Ricochet and Sammy Guevara are going to do 630s before the margin of error is too thin and you're going to land on your neck or you're going to fuck up somebody doing that, landing really hard on them or whatever else, and you're going to have to stop doing it. To combine those two into a move was like, oh my god! Um, yeah, it's on another level. Like we've been looking for like the next high flyer. Like there's, a, I mean, you know, it's Vikingo, it, but it's also going to be him, him too. They yeah. need, like it's Ninja Mac and Vikingo. When he uh, gets the next though, it's going to be a fucking problem. Do you understand? Do you understand? Is it? He has to go to Mexico. The ninja. He has the to ninja. Go to Mexico. The ninja. Like, yeah. Uh, in the middle of this match, I I I, I said to uh, y'all like. <sighs> If this dude had been around, like, during the WCW versus the world or WCW Vengeance thing, like, we all would have been playing with Ninja Mac, like, on a regular basis. The same way, like, we were playing with, you know, like, Black, you know, uh, Great Sasuke, who was Black Ninja. Like, same thing. Same thing. Yep. Just awesome. So, he ends up winning the match, and, like, the crowd, the crowd was into him. Like, Liger, Liger, who was... It was funny, because, like, I, I'm watching with Japanese commentary... Uh, and like, I prefer Japanese commentary, English commentary, watching Puro. I just do. It, maybe it's because, like, I used to, used to pirate all this shit, and now it's the only way I could get it. And I'm just accustomed to hearing, like, charismatic people, and it's almost like a soccer call, where just all the char- charisma and emotion you feel, the passion is, as the match is going on, and, uh, what's wrong? <laughs> Peligro, Peligro! Uh, like, same thing, like, when I hear, you know, Hugo Savinovich on AAA, like, I just like that enthusiasm. Uh, so I'm listening to the audio. I'm like, that sounds like Liger, but Liger is in New Japan. He's not, he would be doing this. Is my brain doing a pulling a racism? And then like, sure enough, in the middle of Ninja Mac match, while you're doing some crazy move, I see Liger at commentary and I was like, what? Okay. It it wasn't me that time. So that's good. That's good. It's good that, you know, you know, I didn't, I didn't pull a, I wasn't bigoted. It's good that it, it wasn't. I wasn't just tripping. You know, it's good. So, yeah, Liger was there, and he was like, he was like, he was really enthusiastic at Ninja Mac. He really enjoyed it. So, like, shout out Ninja Mac. That man did it, and uh, Dante Leon. He could he could wrestle his ass off too. Like, but got to throw got to throw these up for, for, for Ninja Mac. Got to throw them up. You know. Indeed, yeah. but uh, yeah, man, it was an awesome match. I, <sighs> well, I'm so you gotta, happy. You gotta Ninja check it out. Is, you gotta check it out. It's growing in profile. Um, yeah. when he comes back, boy, I I can't wait. I and, and he's already breaking people's brains. Send him to the AEW. Oh my God. Yes, bring him over. Oh my God, I need to see I, that in Phoenix. I need that. Yeah, I need that. Like I, I just want to see them just like straight, straight springs pogo stick action on them boys. Like, yeah. Yeah, book them. Find find a way. <laughs> so, bear with me. I gotta figure out uh, one last thing before I get to the next match. But uh, I, at this point, I uh, uh, cherry picked. I think next match I have this was a um, like a like a Quattro's match with like Sakuraba in it, and I watched it for a split second to see what Sakuraba would do, and uh, he did some comedy with, uh, like he normally does with. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that was fun while it lasted. But uh, then I, I skimmed through uh, the Masato Tanaka and RVD match versus uh, Super Crazy uh, and his tag partner Masawa. And man, uh, Masato, I mean, Masato Tanaka is always, he's never not been good. Like, ever since the first time we ever saw him in ECW, like, he's still that level of wrestler somehow 22 years later. And he still does crazy shit and falls through stuff and does all that, all that hard ass brawling. That man's, that man's made out of something different. Like, we need to make whatever he's made out of, we need to put that on spaceships uh, so they can come safely back into Earth's orbit uh, when, or atmosphere when they uh, come back. Uh, but, um, yeah, like RVD did all of his spots. He did the, you know, put him on the, put him on the, uh, the barricade outside and jump off the apron with the suit with the spin kick. Um, frog splash two thirds across the ring. 
uh, did Rolling Thunder. Him, look, Team ECW with uh, RVD and uh, Tanaka look like well, like they might got some. Like RVD look still looked good. Like he still really do this. Like I wouldn't mind if obviously I think ethically I don't know if that would work, but like. If they were to say, hey, we need a legend to come out here and fall off shit now that we got uh, the one that we had uh, in rehab, if you want to put him next to Matt Hardy, I wouldn't mind it because it, it looked like RVD could still go. He like he has just as much uh, or probably more uh, for us than uh, Brother Nero uh, at, at this moment. Man. Um, so, so then uh, we ended up getting like basically like to get the olds on the card match. Um the old guard, if you will, you have, I mean, that's like Noah in general. Yes, I know. But like <laughs> when you get to the main event, you really see it. Uh, you or not the main event. This, the, uh, the third from the top match, a tag team match. You really see it when it's like, you see Thatcher and Hideki Suzuki and Cass Vegeta and Sakuraba and, uh, Segura. And you're just like, that sounds like a unit. I have no interest in <laughs> bro. <laughs> I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, Segura can still wrestle his ass off, but it's like every like, and I, you know, I like Thatcher, but like the rest of them, I like Sakura because he's funny, but like Kaz and Hideki Suzuki, get fucked. Don't they're blight and they're they're not they're just they're just there to just ruin whatever you got planned. <laughs> so, uh, so for me, uh, so watching this match, like it, so it is uh, is go, it's. Uh, Segura is Kaz Vegeta versus uh, Nakajima, uh, Funaki, and Soya. So they built towards um, Go versus Nakajima, and you already know what you're getting. You're getting the best of the best, the best chops in the business, the best kicks in the business, back and forth. Kicks versus chops, it is great. And like the whole time, as as they going through this match, like they're just keeping Kaz Vegeta like just on the apron. He ain't doing shit. He just ain't doing shit. But everybody is in going back and forth, and they're having a really good match. And then, then you end up getting Funaki in there, and he's rolling with Segura, and that's fun. And it's basically like you know, Stone Cold rolling wrestler, muscle bound Segura, elbows, and everything else versus Funaki with the kicks, but they can also, but he can still roll. Mm-hmm. And like that's good, and then they end up getting Soya in, in like Soya versus, uh, I want to say it was um, Go, but either way, it was very good. And then at the end, they just bring in uh, Fujita, and Fujita sells for for Soya for a little bit, and then he just he crushes him coming off the ropes with a with a, a either a spear or a shoulder tackle, and then beast bombs him and pins him. And, like, he was in for, like, maybe, like, the last two minutes of the match and just won. And I was like, <laughs> thank you, Fujita. Thank you. I'm so glad you were a champion. I'm so glad that you kicked fucking uh, Nak- uh, Nakajima's head in a couple months back. Appreciate it. And when you won the belt. Great. Awesome. So, they get the fuck out of there. And then you get, uh, you know, probably the reason why this show drew so well. Like you see what they drew at Budokan? Mm-mm. It's like thirty two hundred. Right, right. So it is uh, the last. It's, it's like the last match in Noah uh, in you know the retirement match for Budokan Hall. Keiji Muto versus uh, Kaito Kiyomiya, and uh, this match was fucking awesome. I don't know what is going on where we can have these wrestlers in their late fifties with Steve Austin and Muto. They're doing, and they're doing it to, to totally separate, differently, different ways, but they can have these fun ass matches at this age, right? With that kind of wear and tear, both of them with, you know, creaky ass sawdust, rusted knees and bad hips. And they can still get the job done. This match is telling the story of old guy, can't do it no more. Young guy is ascending at this point, and they, and they say showing in the VTR where like you know they've met before, 
Um, you know, you know how that's going. K- Kiyomi has never gotten a big win. That's been a big thing in Noah that he can never get a big win. Um, but he's I'm shocked. So, but he's so talented. And they tell this story where, like, he just, uh, Kiyomi just shuts off Muto's water. Nothing he can do works. The only thing that works is he keeps trying to get these, uh, drag suit leg whips. And, like, Kiyomi keeps cutting them off and then going to, uh, from there, basically, like, uh, almost like, basically, like, blocking them with a stop, like, stomping or whatever, so not twisting off. And then, like, he picks the arm and then puts them in arm bars, different type of arm submissions, and he's working uh, Muda's arm to try to try to stop him from doing it. But, you know, that's what Muda does at this point. He's going to give you the Shining Wizard. He's going to give you a bunch of Dragon Street Leg Whips. He might have, depending on how he feels that day, he might have the, you know, the uh, the, the charging knee off, uh, with the handspring knee, and he might give you the uh, uh, the, the moonsault, right? So, he is not working. He's going for it two times, three times, every time it works. He keeps grabbing it, putting him in another arm submission. So then eventually, Muda gets, a, gets an opportunity, works, gets his knee, and then he starts going to work on the knee. And eventually, like, they tell the story of the, the fourth time he goes for the, uh, the Dragon Street leg whip, like, Kiyomiya, he does a stomp again, but this time it hurts after he gets the knee working. And then Muda goes to work on him. Puts him into uh, the figure four. Uh, some interesting near falls and, and you know, reach, re- grabbing for the ropes. Uh, a rope, rope escapes. And then uh, Kiyomiya works over his knee. So now, it, now it's turned into a Tanahashi match, right? Where both, like, it is now selling and, uh, and storytelling and psychology of these two people with water shelf. And Kiyomiya, as his knee gets progressively worse, his selling is incredible. Like, I want to send this to like Seth Rollins and the rest of Oshiki and in uh, Saya uh, Kamatani and say like this is how you do it when your knee is really fucked up like this is how you do it right so match continues and as the match progress uh, uh, keeps going and uh, Kiyomiya uh, keeps going because he's younger he can recover better his knee he he can start doing a few more things because his knee is not like as jacked up it feels a little bit better but it's not it's never great um so then you get to the point where like Kiyomiya I'm just gonna cut to the end because I could go for I go another five minutes talking about this match but basically at the end that both of their knees are worked over uh you get the big near fall off of Muto hitting hitting the perfect Muto uh uh moonsault looks like, you know, as sharp and as dangerous and just straight line as it's ever been. And, um, just kiss the kick out crowd pops huge for it. They get back up and Kiyomiya works over that knee, goes back to work at the knee, st- steals a shining wizard after Muda's used a bunch of them. And actually he blocked one. He actually had a run of them where Muda was going for a few of them. And he actually blocked the last one that would have probably put Kiyomiya down. But anyway, you he has his own shine and reserve his own. You and need then, some joy in this match. Dude, th- this is one of the best matches of the year. I, I like I I went I went four and a half on this match, but we'll get we'll get to it. So Kiyomiya finally finally gets him just done, and he 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 uh, actually early in the match actually put on his own figure four. So he gets to gets to it again, gets the figure four. And, and Mudo just he's not he won't do it he won't give up won't tap out just but he's stuck so then uh Kimia gets him up hits his own leg screw and then puts him back in it and 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 like Muda's just like I'm not not doing it not doing it and then I forgot like Kimia like basically like wrenches one last time and he made fucking Mudo tap out I jumped out my seat. I was like, hell yeah. Cause like, we've been watching Noah, uh, since the beginning of this year. And like the guys that were the best guys kept getting their asses handed to them over and over again by these old fucks that can't go no more at that, at that level that they go at. It felt, it was like, it was like, man, I've been getting my ass kicked. I've had enough. Like, and he just beat this dude and he beat with his own fucking move in the middle and that man had to tap out and then like, the thing that I liked about this the most was Muro got tap- tapped out 
He immediately gets out the ring and walks off to go give Kiyomiya his shine. Kiyomiya grabs him um, before he gets out, out halfway out up the aisle. And like they, I think they either, either half hugged or gave a handshake, whatever else. Kiyomiya go, gets back in the ring. He cries and walks off. I was like, about time we get some fucking good news and know him aside from the occasional really good match. Finally, some good news that we can actually do something with this. Yo, and like, I'm so shocked. Muto lost. Same here. Same to, here. I'm to, so pleasantly surprised. To Kiyomiya here because like, what about Keiji Muto's history shows that he was cool with laying down right. and submitting to another man? Like what? Like I, right. this is foreign to, you right. know, to, to him. Um, kind of makes like his uh his farewell run like he took like a it was like a uh, he dropped a fall so early in it it's like well he could lose it any time now and it, I think it actually makes it more exciting. Yeah, yeah. I'm just so what can happen. I, I'm just I'm just very happy that Kiyomiya got this one. I like that dude so good. Like I I, I I'm I'm sorry, but like we got to do it. I don't think we've talked about it on air before, but Josh Smith. Kiyomiya is only but so only but so much or he's not that much better or or they're about the same as like as as Master Watto. Uh uh-uh. uh. Nah we, man. This is ridiculous. We need you to scrub that for no, we need more to scrub that. now. He went out there and had a fucking psych- psychological put on a psychological clinic with a dude that can't run and jump or do much of anything except for like four moves. And it's was compelling as all hell. He's probably as athletic as Kendrick Perkins is right now. Man, like I, dude, I, I just um, I don't know if that was an audio on keeping the strong out. If it is, scrub the archives. No, it was. Uh, we were just talking. He, he was just, like wasn't impressed with Kiyomiya like we were after we were you know watched uh, his match with Kino from Abu Hall on uh, New Year's Day, and, and like it also was like you know also us seeing him at uh. Cyber Fight Festival last, last year. year. Yeah. Yeah, when he was uh, tagging with uh, uh, Kitamiya. But uh, I, that dude's great. That dude's fucking great. Like, I just, like, New Japan, like, New Japan with him and with uh, Ninja Mac would love to have these fucking junior l- level guys or guys that could be in the junior division right now. They would love nothing more than to have those two guys at their disposal. Right? Like, was, people are already talking about heavyweights. No- right. Yeah. Um, so. Then, as great as that match was with Muto and in, in, uh, Kiyomiya, and now we got to talk about some other shit. We got to talk about the tag team title match for the vacant belts. It's Timothy Thatcher and Hideki Suzuki versus uh, Masa Kiyomiya and uh, uh, Inamura, uh, y- Yoshiki Inamura. Now, Yoshiki Inamura, uh, you know as... Uh, well, you know uh, Kiyomiya from him tagging with... Kill me at uh, Cyber Fight Festival when he was like, I, you know, I didn't exactly. know that you can skip this match. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm, no, we got to be properly buried. But uh, like, remember at the time watching that match, like it was a great match, but it felt like you know that was the wrong place for Kitamiya. But like when I've seen him, he's just a big hoss, you know, big barrel chested man, right? That's short and stocky and you know lifts hell of weight, right? And he's good, right? So Kishiki. Uh, Inamura, my first time seeing him was that mat, that tag match for him and uh, Kenta at Budokan. He's, he's way like, too much like, energy, right? Like you, you know, like they, like a shoot was breaking out, right? That, but that's how they, that's the style. It, it was great, right? So they're a tag team, and it's like this is like if in my mind I'm like this is like the male version, like Mariah and Ida were a tag team, just like <laughs> just just awesome. So it's it's Thatcher and it's Suzuki, and Suzuki gets in, and he gets in, and like he does. He just does grapple porn. It's not masturbatory. It's just porn, right? Oh. It's not like let me show you. How, it's not let me show you how the moves I could do. It's like I'm going to put you in a lot of moves, but it's not like all right. Now you're just showing off. It's not like the the, the amount the million flips version of grappling, but it's just I'm doing move after move after move, and it's not fun at all for for anybody that's involved watching it. I'm like great. This is great. So they get Thatcher in. Thatcher's much better than him. So he's making it work. And he's also throwing, deciding to say, how about I do this thing called striking to make it have some, some type of dynamic elements to go with the wrestling, right? Because, you know, wrestling, 
it's, we made it fake because it's not really interesting. Uh, so then after, you know, Thatcher is ca- carrying his portion of the match, they bring in Suzuki <laughs> for the finish with Inamura. And dude, he just punks, like he sells for Inamura as Inamura showing all this fire and heart and striking, whatever else and, and clubbing. And then he just shuts off his water, kicks his ass. Hideki Suzuki kicks Inamura's ass and then finishes him after Inamura fights back and fires up and goes for one last like uh charge try to win a match he basically backpacks him puts him in a sleeper hold and fall in in more false face first so uh Zuki's on his on top of him on the mat and then the ref has to stop him after raising his arm three times i was like bro if this is what hideki suzuki does or is or is known for this is my first time i've seen him wrestle but you know i knew about him and obviously the julia a connection and him in Diamond Mine in NXT, and he never let him wrestle. He was just like the coach. And it was like, oh, I can see why he was a coach. Nobody ever want to watch him wrestle like that on American television. Uh, comment session uh, Hideki Suzuki is JSPW, Josh Smith Pro Wrestling. Nah. I don't think Josh would want to wrestle like Hideki Suzuki. I, I, I don't, I hope not. He would, but he be, but his vision of wrestling will have to be way more. Um, it's just an outdated way of wrestling. It's an outdated, outdated way of wrestling. Like he's not doing world, world. Uh, I'm sorry, world of sport, flashy stuff. He's just a basic ass wrestler. He's a basic ass grappler. That doesn't throw many strikes. Like it's just, it, it's a no for me, dog. Just no. Um, and I, and then like, I ended up uh, messaging JD from Rayleigh Leaf Retrocast. I was like, bro, is this how he, is this, is this actually how he, this is real get down? He was like, yeah, this is real get down. I was like, and then he talked about, you know, he then he buried about like the politics he's always played. And, you know, like I remember, the, you know, I was pissed off when he ended up, uh, in that tag match few months back pinning, uh, Nakajima. Nakajima. Yeah, yeah. About what a back suplex and he hold and he hooks the leg and he hooks the leg like. For ten seconds after the after the three count was made, I was like, "You're an asshole. Get the fuck out of here, man." And then, oh, the, the worst part about it was like, people were in the Inamura coming back, and also Kitamiya, like when they're in, and like when like when they actually hit near falls to win, or near falls or whatever else, like the Hawks team was going to win. The crowd was up for it, and then every time Suzuki Hideki Suzuki hit like a near fall, the crowd fucking groaned. You can. Uh, you can audibly hear them groan like, oh, fuck. They did not want to be the tag Sir champions. Sam sounds like a good fit for Terminus. Dude. Yes. Export them to Terminus. <laughs> it's like sitting over to that shit. Like, Dude, just like, I mean, look, we've seen Thatcher have great matches, whether it was the um, the fight pit or it was the tough white man match from Bash, or not Bash of the Beach, Great American Bash 2021. He can wrestle different style. Jackie Suzuki, this is what he wants to do. And I gotta say, bro, like the the people don't want to see this. They don't reverse RLPW. <sighs> so, um, get so your ass some, up. And yeah, fight. So the, yeah, and then it's had to follow like this great super emotionally ma- super emotional storytelling match with the, with the most over person in the company, and then at, with this shit, it's like man, get out of here. I gave this shit. It went like twenty six minutes. I gave it three flat fucking stars. Yikes. Yeah. Or 20, 23, 26, 28 minutes. Anyway, um, the next match was the junior heavyweight match. Uh, it is champion Hayata versus, uh, Seki Yoshi, uh, Yoshioka. Um, (sighs) Yoshioka is real. He is fucking good. Hayata, he's good too, but he clearly, like, only wants to wrestle in sudden spurts like so if you were to condense this whole match down and distill it into like how do i say this this would be like if you were to take an azumi high speed match and at random parts give it like two minutes here cut off regular wrestling two minutes here cut off regular wrestling two minutes here cut off regular wrestling and it went like i don't know probably 20 minutes something like that but um ultimately uh Hayata ends up winning with a basement spike in Rana, which is a cool finish. Uh, but, like, I was far more impressed with the challenge than I was a champion. And 
I thought it was telling that uh, before the match started, they put Ninja Mac on English commentary and they showed him. And I was like, hmm. Hmm. Looking at the cage match, it seems like the Noah fans are not very happy with Ninja Mac oh, being here. Oh, I saw that. I was like, get the fuck out of here. They gave that shit two and a half stars. Like, oh, okay. Dude, Rich, when you watch this match, I want you to get back to me and tell me if you thought this was a two and a half star match or if this was a four and a half star match. You tell I, me which one it was more like. I got a feeling I'm going to come on with like a five minute rant yeah. uh, following this. Like, I've seen the gifts. Um, I've seen the rest, a clip, clip Rich, of the finish. This isn't just a thing where it's just a bunch of spots <clears throat> and crummy wrestling in between. Ninja Mac can actually do all the stuff between the big moves. Like, if this match had happened in Arena Mexico, we'd be talking about this one of the best matches of the year. Amazing. Zach says the Japanese Noah fans love Ninja Mac. Oh, so it's just the other, the others. It, yes, it's the it's the pure old dorks as you call them. Yes. So, um, then you end up getting a main event. You end up getting uh, Satoshi Kojima versus Kino. The VTR for this thing, I didn't know a single word. I just I know it. You don't need them. But if you know about New Japan, you know you know about when Noah pulled up on. Night two of Russell Kingdom. You know what this is. They have given the belt to a fucking New Japan dad. Kino is not Kino is not having that shit. They show Kino basically like jogging in a in a in a uh, a in a uh, Congo track suit with the Congo shirt, which is like he, he there's no way he's ever done this. But anyway, they show him <laughs> they show him jogging from like from in the grass, like he's in a village, and all of a sudden he's next thing you know he's in a city. And he's jogging as if he's like been jogging miles and miles. And he's all mm-hmm. of a sudden he, he jogs and he walk, he walks by this building that has a New Japan lion lion head logo. And he stops and he's like disgusted. And then he walk and he runs off. And he and then you <laughs> see him you see him basically talk about like this fucking New Japan uh, dad has a fucking uh, GHC. I can't believe this shit's happening. I'm I'm cutting this shit off. And. So then they get their interests, whatever else. It's awesome interests, as you've always seen in Noah for main, for main events. Kojima's was awesome, too. Um, and this match is just, like, just just good-ass, solid rest for, like, 26 minutes. And Kojima, like, hit, they start with the match with a little bit of comedy where, like, you know, he, Kojima does a fl- you know, pecs, or flexes the pecs yeah. or whatever else. Mm-hmm. And then Kino th- uh, get, beats him out of the ring and... And then he looked like he's about to do like some flip dive, but he does like the uh, the rebound off the ropes and then cartwheels like almost like in a in a Osprey ricochet like fashion. But it's a cartwheel because he's not nearly he's not going to do all the back handspring shit. And then he goes back and does the, the you know, does his pose with the fist. Right. And then and then uh, he starts while he's doing the pose. With, you see they zoom in on his pecs. And he's doing the, the pec. The you know the te- pet bounce. Oh my god, man! It was so fucking funny. So then it turns into you know kicks versus elbows and lariats and selling up and down and like there's so much stuff. But like ultimately, I thought it was a great match. But the 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 finish of this match, man. Kino goes up to the top rope with uh, Kojima laid out, and this man hits a moon salting double knee drop. Yes, I saw this. Holy shit! Four flat stars. I have yet to see a singles match that wasn't awesome that Kino's been in. Um and like, you know, out of all the new out of all the Noah guys, he's the guy I relate to the most. And like the funniest part is I came across him off the suggestion from people like Zach, people like Murray, that said, Hey, like this dude is not with the shenanigans and the foolishness. This man is about wrestling and wrestling hard and wrestling right. And he whooped uh, the Booker of DDT's ass in that Congo versus Goofballs match at, so at uh, Cyber the Fight right way. Dude, this man. The Larry Brown. Yes. Yes, Rich. That's where I'm getting at. This man has a a. This man has a. Uh, what do you call it? This man has a code, if you will, uh, and rules to live by in pro wrestling. And this man lives up to it. Every time I see him, it man Russell Harris, he has great matches. He talks cash shit. He buries people. What? And he's an asshole. What's not to like about this fucking guy? What's not to like about Kino? I love this fucking guy. I've seen him wrestle like maybe a dozen times. Maybe 
somewhere between a dozen and ten times I've seen him wrestle. Every time I've enjoyed him wrestle. When he comes out and brings that energy of like, I'm an asshole, I don't give a fuck, I'll say anything to any one of you, I don't I, I don't care, I'll fight you, I don't care. Slapping the shit out of people at press conferences, Nakajima does that too, but my point. Like, yeah, Nakajima's just, my guy, but, you know. I, I, no, no, I like, I like their top four guys, their, their top four wrestlers, whether it's Go, whether it's uh, Kiyomiya, whether it's uh, uh, Kino, whether it's Nakajima. I, lo- I like watching all four of them, but my actual, like, I like, just of the just of the the personality and the gear and the energy, Kino is Kino for me. Like dude's just like and you know t- looking back when you know you mentioned like uh, the New Japan dads and all the political old guys and that main event mafia thing that they have going on with or whatever else and then like Kino was when he came into the year was the national champion. He lost it to Funaki and it was like, well, what the fuck? And then, you know, you cast Vegeta beat Nakajima. He was like, what the fuck? And then you hear about all the stuff with night three, the main event of night three for Rust Kingdom when Muto is doing all this stuff to not look weak so they, they can make Kiyomiya like be the one that like gets his ass kicked completely. And you're like, what the fuck? And like you look for, you now see it and it's like, okay, so. After they've already, you know, they got No Sao out of there. There's somebody else handling this book. They, the guys that were the best wrestlers that were, you know, at the top of the card for the Budokan Hall show, like, they came down and now they're ramping back up. And it's like, thank you. Give us the good wrestlers. Get these old fuckers out of here. Mudo, gone. Kaz, he should be out of here. F- like, Hideki Suzuki, I never want to see him wrestle ever again. <laughs> Elevate Ninja Mac. Let's go. Yes, yes, yes. So... <laughs> Like, so like looking at that, like he lost to that old dude. He talked that shit about the new, like new Japan dad, and old guys. And now he is the champion. And like, you know, you know, you're going to get a Segura match and a go match and a, and a Nakajima match. Like it's going to be fun again. We get to actually cover Noah now again, rich man. Look at that. Yes. They, they have flushed some of that shit out of here. And now it looks like, I actually want to watch their big shows again and stuff and see their title matches, not their nonsense. Zach, when does the N1 start if you're in the Gotta comments be soon. still? Got to be soon. It's normally, That's... what, fall? Late summer? But, um, 8.14, he thinks. Yeah. Sounds about right. So, interested to see how that's laid out. But uh, But, yeah, man, like, in general, this was a fun show. Uh, now, Rich, last week we did not have time for Tokyo Joshi Pro Summer Sun Princess. I ah. think I think we may uh, have to punt um, mm, okay. on Tokyo Joshi Pro once again. All right. um, this, this is what I'm gonna say. This is what I'm gonna say real quick. It, it, I'll, I'll go through the match. I'll go through the match real quick. Real quick. Actually, real quick. Actually, real quick. The opener, fine. But general, before I get through all this, I like Juria. Yes, Juria is great. Or is going to be great. Uh, this is easily the best Tokyo Joshi Pro match or show I've ever seen. Like top to bottom, I have never seen the Tokyo Joshi Pro match like have consistent matches with no, not that much bullshit. They had the one bullshit match, got the fuck out of here, and it was second match with Aja Kong. Aja Kong was funny with with Raku or whatever else. But in general, like all these matches were very good to great after like match three or something like that. So like Tokyo Joshi Pro like. This was a this was the best show I've ever seen from the top to bottom. Like in the ring, as far as in the ring stuff, all the matches got time. They weren't wasting time with like trying to do all these elaborate instances to make their stars like big stars while they're doing this show in front of fifteen thousand people at tops. Like they didn't do that. They just went out there and they let the wrestlers wrestle, which we always say we want in a at uh, at One Nation Radio, and they succeeded. And they quite frankly do stop treating them on a lot of these shows like. We got to have funny and this goofy shit. No, nah, let the wrestlers wrestle. And they um, did the singing and dancing too, right. and it was a lot of yeah. wrestlers uh, that were like seeing their first time in front of cheering fans. This was the first yeah. cheering fan show in Japan um, that was back on a, on a, in a big venue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Shogun Abe versus Rika Tatsumi. I gave it four and a quarter. I thought this match was great. Um, the main event, or some main event, the tag match, gave it four stars. I thought it was overindulgent, went too long. And, like, you're asking a lot to put uh, Yuki Arai, who we're talking about, off air. 
um, putting her in a tag match, go 26 minutes, but like she was in there with Saki Kai, who's really good, and Yuka and Mizuki were, always have good defenses. Uh, so we we talked a little bit about Miyu Yamashina versus Thunder Rosa. I gave it four flat stars. People might give it three and three quarters. I liked it more than most people. Um, yeah, I'd probably say four. Yeah. Maki Ito versus Alex Windsor. I like this match a lot. I like Alex Windsor. I think she could, be, I think she's like super Jamie hater. Like just big, like a, a big, like mean gaijin that throws around a small Japanese woman. And like she did in an athletic way and like was smooth. And Maki Ito ha- was fighting and fighting and fighting and like wasn't fighting like for her life, was fighting to be like, I'm tough too, damn it. And uh, that was fun. I ended up giving this three and three quarters. Do you remember this match or no? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, then uh, May Saruga and Suzume versus Riho and Risu Endo. Uh, Risu Endo and Suzume, normally tag team partners. Uh, Riho and May Saruga, like the two, you know, like two notable students, Emi Sakura. So they had like this kind of friction of like, Smoke in the city. like who, like who is Emi's favorite? That sort of thing. That match was fun. I gave it three and a, uh, and a half. Uh, Shida and Hikari Noah versus Yuki Kamafuku and uh, Mahiro. Uh, Mahiro wasn't ready for this stage. Uh, but like, you know, uh, but like it was an okay match. I ended up giving it, uh, I think, uh, three stars. I'm kind of yeah, in. Stars. I'm kind of into uh, Haraki. What was her name? Hikari Noah. Hikari Noah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll end with this. Uh, Miyu Yamashita versus uh, not Miyu Yamashita. Uh, Miyu Watanabe versus yes. versus uh, Rio <laughs> Ryu, Mizunami. Ryu, Ryu Mizunami. Ryu Mizunami. Man, like she's fucking good. Like when you let her not be a comedy wrestler and say be a serious wrestler, she has good matches. Miyu Watanabe. They built towards uh, her doing a giant swing. And she finally got it. Uh, ultimately, uh, she went back and forth brawling, which is something I've never really see her do. But she's just a strong, strong power wrestler. And like, uh, this, was her away. this was a very good match. Very damn good. Match. I, gave it, I think I gave it three, three and three quarters. I yeah. would have probably gone four on this one. Mm. Um, I mean, it was fun. It was fun. Like, it was just like, like I feel like me, Watanabe, should be a really big star. It, that's what you know. That's what I want. That's what I want. When like I watch Togashi Pro, she sticks out as like the distinct power wrestler, and with the charisma she has, you know, doing the up up girls, you know, idol idol stuff. It's fun. She just she just a ball of charisma. I think if she were in AEW, she'd get over in a heartbeat. Um, and she was doing the singing and dancing right. too. Yeah. So. so that that's that's the fast version of that. Sorry, but y'all got what you got. Like. You know, I don't know if we get uh, Marx. I don't know if we get like uh, by the jo- Joshi fandom is, is being like just only stardom or whatever else, or we hate Tokyo Joshi Pro, but like this is a damn good show. This no, is a damn I had show. I had fun watching the the matches I saw. I, w- I was really into it. I was happy to see the wrestlers that were getting their streamers for the first time. Streamers were coming back. Uh, this was a really feel good show. Got a lot of great reviews on Twitter too yeah. um, from people. Some people calling it a show of the year. It is um, not so. so. It is not, you know. but it is easily the best Tokyo Pro show I've I've ever saw. Um, but yeah, uh, like I think they smoked the the uh, the Sumo Hall show they had in March. But uh, but yeah, that's 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 the end of it. Uh, yeah, I caught um, the first day of the G one. Uh, it's 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 good. It's it's not like I don't think there's really like, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's not like you know the classic G ones of the past or anything like that. Like Gotta it was let like that one go, bro. We ain't never yeah, man. That. Like we are not in those days no more. Um, I thought Osprey and Phantasmo was was pretty good. I don't think they went as crazy as they were capable of. Very creative finish in that match. Um, of course they had uh, Tanahashi lose to Aaron Hanare yeah. and kind of like a nothing match, and it was like three stars if that and i was like man. depressing yeah i was like look man i don't give a fuck josh tanahashi needs to come to america if this is his future putting over the likes of aaron hanare and then doing a rematch against the likes of tetsuya naito who he's had ten thousand matches against um kazushi okada a, a match that no longer draws anywhere in the country um 
<laughs> or who, who else should I go down the list? Uh, all these people that he's wrestled, Hiroki Goto, like, no, bring Tanahashi over to America for his twilight. Let him finish over here, get some big matches, some big promos, big moments, and let him do his thing. Who do you want? I'll trade somebody for him right now. I mean, with Muto coming out, he there's a spot. <laughs> Jesus, like, bro, I don't know how Tanahashi is going to do in this thing, and he could fuck around and turn it around, right? But right now, it doesn't look turn good. It, turn it around to what, though? Right. Like, when they eliminated him before the final night in 2020, I was like, oh my god, they're, like, I understand they, they were already down cycling him, but it's like, you, he's still their biggest draw. Like, the idea of being that careless with, I thought it was careless at that point, but like clearly what they're doing with him is like, they're, they're shipping him out the door. Like they are, they are making him into new Japan. Dad was like, dude, this man just had a, this man just was on a pay-per-view that sold 120 something thousand buys on pay-per-view. And he had a four and a half star match with, a dude, that, to with a dude that is not a super wrestler, right? Like there's not some elite worker in the ring. He's damn good. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm talking. I want to say this. I mean, as far as ta- overall general talent level, not to say that Masan having a great year isn't a best in ring performer candidate this year because he absolutely is. But I'm saying, like, as far as his skill set, like, this is not Kota Ibushi we're talking right. about. He had that kind of match with, right? This dude is still super duper valuable in like New Japan. Is like even even will lacking someone that can replace him. They are just seemingly rushing out the door. It reminds me in a way almost like of Cena. In mm-hmm. 2015, we were like, we just got to put, we just got to make uh, Roman the guy right now because John Cena may leave in two years. Two years a long fucking time. Yeah. And, and, and I just say, like, there, like there's not a fresh match on anywhere in sight for him in New Japan. Right. So, like, the like he's not going to challenge for the IWGP title. He's not going to be wrestling, um, like, Will Ospreay or anything. Like, it doesn't really make sense like that. And then... He's had 10,000 matches against everybody else. Mm-hmm. Send him on an excursion. I mean, when they do, I mean, and they already kind of do that when they do the pay-per-views. He's at mm-hmm. most of them here. Um, I, Sonata and Jay White was um, was more enjoyable than I thought it would be down the stretch. I good. think. I think uh, throughout the first like uh, parts of the match, it was like, "Come on, man!" Like, of course, like and it Jay was White doing like, Jay White, he yes. doing him, and, and, and then you know Sonata just like, bro, like he got to cut that shit, and by that shit, I mean all of it, like cut, like the, the beard, the hair, nah, man, just just start it was with worse the one. than normal. Start with the one, like I, it, I just it I was don't worse know than it, one, or it's gotten unruly. I don't know if is if I just haven't seen Sonata in a while, and I'm just like looking at him again. I'm just like, bro, this looks horrible. How does like, it just, look compared to like the t- to <sighs> two years ago's G1? Worse, same. I have no memory. I have I have uh, no memory of this. I um, mean, it wasn't the best match you saw from that day. Yeah, it was not. Um, but uh, him and him and White was enjoyable down the stretch. Okay, uh, and then Cobb and Okada was pretty good in the main event. I'd probably say like four and a quarter. Uh, Okada was taking some sick slams and bumps in this match, and it was like, yo, he's getting slammed around a lot in this shit <laughs> by Cobb. So um, the, the, he hit him with a, with a Rainmaker finish, and like it wasn't the most like impactful kind of mm-hmm. Rainmaker I've ever seen. Um, but you know, it was it was solid enough for night one. But there's no like you know go go crazy over anything there. I saw the first uh, match of night two, which was Tai Chi and Tomiro Ishii, and man. The G1 MVP don't miss. Uh, Tomohiro Ishii and Tai Chi, they are. Uh, I feel like the they story, always have good matches together. They always, always have very good, good matches, matches together. together. Great. I, and I feel like the general storyline of this is Tomohiro Ishii says, Tai Chi, Cut I don't give I, I don't give a fuck what you do against anybody else. But when you come in here with me, we gonna do it. Like we gonna run it, and I <laughs> want your fucking best. And and he gets it from him every time. And Tai Chi was incredible in this match. They were just beating the fuck out of each other, going back and forth, kicking out at one. Um, they got some. They got some time. And this, I, I thought I saw Jeremy give this one four and a half. Um, mm-hmm. Probably I can. I can see that. I can see four and a quarter. Uh, but 
yeah, if this is like, you know, the the final countdown of Tomohiro Ishii in the G1, yeah, man. Um, I have enjoyed one, one of the greatest performers that ever uh, entered God's green earth. Um, and I look forward to seeing what else he has uh, planned. And this was a hell of a match. Like, this has been a match of the tournament so far. Hey, him and Tanahashi, Western Expansion. Let's do it. Um, I, I didn't see the second half of the show. I heard the, the Kenta and the... Zack Sabre Jr. match was really good. Um, I don't remember what day two's main event was going to be. I don't know. Oh, Shingo and Juice. I didn't see that one. Okay. So I, I got to check that out. But uh, they're back when, Wednesday, right. I believe. Yeah, and, I know. I got to catch up. And that is, uh, I believe, Naito versus Goto in the main event. So, Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... I don't know what your schedule is, or whatever else, but with either either you either with you or without you, uh, I'll do a um, midweek show to catch up on G one proper from night three on, and then um, I'll preview, I'll I'll review and preview like this past weekend in Stardom and uh, say, preview. When, when's the new Stardom pay per view? Is it Saturday? Uh, the yes, the, they doing a you know Saturday show. I don't know if that's pay per view or if they're gonna put that on YouTube. Them doing all the all the wacky matches, the starting the showcase match. I don't know. I don't know yet. Uh-huh. But the the day after they're doing the they're doing um the pay per view with Saki W or Saki Watanabe challenging um Kamatani for the white belt and Tam challenges uh Shuri for the red belt. So I'll preview. I'll we'll review. I'll be back or maybe Rich will be back. I don't know. Depending on maybe schedule, but like. Talk about G one and talk and talk about the past week of stardom and preview that paper those pay per views or big shows whatever else so yeah for sure yep uh, thanks for listening y'all be sure to raise some whatever app you're using to listen to this with and um go to if you're listening on the stream or watching on the stream uh go to the PayPal go to the Cash app donate there if you are listening on the podcast links in the description go to our Red Circle drops off a donation and be sure to listen to the other shows on the network. Besides One Nation Radio, you have Keeping It Strong Style, the Ricky and Clyde Wrestling Show. <laughs> Rich is still directing traffic like he's been a white. No. Uh, uh, besides uh, Keeping It Strong Style, Gorman Watch the Shit on Wednesdays, uh, the Grave Consequences Podcast, 8-Bit Suplex, All Things Elite, Great Mass Generator, Get in the Ring, Meet the Press Slam, and AEW Match Guide. Uh, Sir Sam actually just finished oh, yeah. his top yep. 10 for of his list and he's gonna uh so i haven't I haven't watched i just saw he put it up i haven't gone through it yet because it actually is in podcast form so i'm gonna listen to that but uh yeah he actually I was very happy fish it up i haven't seen it. i don't know what the, i don't know what the top 10 is don't tell me but gotcha. you're happy so i'm assuming it has to do something with kenny omega or the young bucks one of the two so uh i'm thinking that's a safe bet right but uh yeah so uh, just uh uh, just let's to one Look, radio. It's, it's to. called all elite wrestling for a reason. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks for listening, y'all. Later. Peace. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive save over $700 on average, and those savings add up. Imagine what you could buy in the future. Hey, remember how 20 years ago I switched to Progressive? Well, now it's the future, and I used all those savings to buy this new hologram phone. Because, you know, it's the future, and everything is holograms now. So switch to Progressive and save big, because those savings can add up in the future. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive in 2020. Potential savings will vary.